Councillors, please stand in your place. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask you that we guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open and I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare material personal interests and conflicts of interest where relevant and the requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Councillors, are there any apologies? There are no apologies. The confirmation of minutes, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,602nd meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Marks, that the minutes of the 4,602nd meeting of Council held on the 3rd of September 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw to your attention the item on the agenda of the public participation. I'd like to call on Mr Gary Herbert, who will address the Chamber on current and future effects of Lantana on our biodiversity. Welcome, Mr Herbert. Um, you may stand or sit as you wish. You have five minutes that begins when you begin. Mr Chair, um, Lord Mayor and Councillors, thank you for this opportunity. Um, many people don't realise that Lantana spreads at a normal rate of 400 plants per plant per year, but where Lantana is allowed to grow on roadsides, that escalates to 6,000 new plants per plant per year. So we are seeing a catastrophe in the expansion rate of these materials because that's access to every single waterway. And that's because councils won't take action against TMR and main roads because of the, um, the um, standing that one section of government won't take action against another section of government. That material growing on roadsides poses the greatest threat to our fires and to the uh, biodiversity loss. It's an open highway all the way from the mountains all the way to the sea. And National Parks plays a large part in that because now I proved last year that um, water is the number one, uh, trans number one uh, transporter of lantana and lantana seeds. And coal is also uncontrollable. So unless it's also uncontrollable. So unless we start to um, hold, even if, if they tell council they won't do it, which TMR may very well do. At least we're setting precedence for the public that the public understand we tried. And that's what I'm trying to do here in addressing council is try to get people to understand I'm happy for them to say, no, we won't do anything, because then at least we can say to the public, we tried, but it is a very serious issue because these fires are going to get predominantly worse. I work in land 40 acres has a thousand dead gum trees on it because of lantana itself and the Belminer birds. Okay, so that is a fire potential that we have never seen before. That is why fireys say these fires are unprecedented. They're not unprecedented, it's just the fuel load and not understanding the part that lantana plays in that devastation of those trees. There's another thousand trees that are within six months to 12 months of dying. Now, those trees cannot hit the ground by falling. They will, will hang up in other trees. And that gives Lantana the bridge to run from ground to the canopies of those trees, which is the worst fires we have. And much of this um, material is happening in steep country, <clears throat> where this material is cascading off the roads down steep country, where we will never deal with it. I can tell you now, I couldn't deal with it. But the problem is, as the fires come roaring up those um, ravines and mountainsides, they're fires that we will have never seen in Queensland before with these dead gum trees. And that's been known for about 20 years that this is happening, that these trees are dying. So it's very important to explain to people at your level what is happening out there in the real, real 
environments so that you can understand that when then that when this material bridges that gap between canopy and the ground there's no so if we have if we deny lantana the access to um, claim more road sides because that is the catalyst that is driving the the uh, increase in its um, production every time it gets 25 millimeters of water off those roadsides it reseeds again so it's in a perpetual situation of reseeding so where we knew it only did 400 new plants per year it's now doing 6,000. it's a catastrophe but the problem is the dispersal off those roads as any flush of water goes down it, it spreads the water spreads those seeds over a much wider area than it ever had access to before so tmr's role in this is far greater than you can imagine and councils constantly say to me well we'll never do anything with them they'll just tell us to go away but at least we did that and then we can say to the public this is such a serious issue of that material flowing off those lands onto your lands which is illegal it's illegal at every level Gov councils know that and have handed people notices for breach of biosecurity security biosecurity have washed their hands and said to me to get the TMR to come out to site and look at it, like listen to me, but at least me, but at least you then have set the precedence to say we are standing with our public, who vote us in, and this is such a serious issue with these fires. When we see a fire in Riverside at Bunya Riverside, Bunya Riverside, um, where you get a get away from one section of the roadway to another section through locked gates blindfolded by smoke can you imagine the death toll of families in and that is in brookfield that is in enormous amounts of different areas in brisbane city council and mr herbert unfortunately yep. your time has expired please, I made please. Point there. thank so, you no, thank you and uh councillor hammond would you care to respond please thank you mr chair and thank you mr herbert for addressing council about this very important issue i can tell you that councillor cooper Councillor Davis and I bring this up with DTMR on a quite a regular basis because those main roads that you're talking about um, are not only um, carrying Latana but also the entryway into this great city. I talk about Gympie Road because the three councillors I just referred to are all Northsiders and we do bring this up quite regularly about their weed management. I'm also quite happy to make, um, write a letter to the minister um, and make representation on what you're saying here today to us. But can I tell you that Brisbane City Council take our biodiversity areas very seriously. That's why this financial year we have spent $3.4 million on our wipeout weeds program across this great city. We also, with Lantana, we understand once it gets into our waterways, it does spread a lot quicker. That's why we concentrate a lot of our weed management, with Lantana in particular and other weed species, in those very important waterways. We also work very closely with private landowners and encourage them and give them incentives to actually help them clean up their own private areas and land and maintain it. We also work and encourage and give grants to our habitat groups and our creek catchment groups, which are very vital to the city. They give up so much time, voluntary hours and hard work to this community to help us keep our waterways clear of weeds. Obviously, it's an ongoing issue and work has to continue in this space. Um, with the devastating fires that are going across our beautiful state at the moment and in Brisbane, um, it's timely that you come and speak to us about the effects. I learnt a little bit from you today and I'd like to be in contact with you at a further date to discuss what you brought up with the Lantana going through um, the, the trees and causing more bushfires and getting those fires up into the tree canopies. Again, thank you so much for coming in to speak to us about this very important issue. And um, I will express my concerns um, and love and prayers to the people in the Sunshine Coast and across this state for the fires that are happening right at this very moment. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Herbert. Thank you. Oh, that's all right. Mr. Tan will come and make sure that uh, escort you to the door. So no, no trouble. Thank you for coming in.
Council has now begins question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a chair of any of the standing committees? Councillor Cunningham. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, sporting clubs across Brisbane have been struggling to pay their water bills, a large part due to the skyrocketing costs of the state government's bulk water charge. Can you outline how this administration plans to assist our valuable clubs with their mounting bills? Lord, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Cunningham, for the question. And it is a really topical one right now. We've uh, obviously on our minds is the uh, the fact that this state is battling um, some serious bushfires and that parts of our state which are normally lush and green are just dry and drought affected and suffering this uh, situation which has generated um, uh, you know, incredible bushfires that are happening in areas we wouldn't expect them. At, at this moment, you go anywhere in the city and you can see uh, on a regular basis, dry sporting fields, um, and the impact that this weather is having also on our sporting clubs around the city is getting worse and worse. And we've all noticed it in recent weeks and recent months, and it is getting drier and drier. And according to the, uh, the BOM, there's no imminent sign of any significant rain um, in the coming weeks either. Uh, we may get some storms, um, and hopefully they'll bring significant rain, but it is highly unlikely that we'll, we'll see any significant rain. September is the driest month, month of the year in Brisbane usually, but at this point in the year, uh, we have seen around 50% of the normal rainfall that our city would get um, at this point in the year. So 50% less rain, drying out uh, our bushland reserves, drying out our sporting fields, and so this leaves our sporting clubs with a big challenge. They need to keep people playing on those fields. They want to prevent them turning into dust bowls. And the obvious issue when you've got less rain is to increase the use of, of water. Now, whether that's tank water or whether that's uh, supplied water from Queensland Urban Utilities, that then comes at a cost to those sporting organisations. These are not-for-profit not community groups that we're talking about here, and these are people that have to raise money by selling sausages at the local sausage sizzle, by fundraising in their local community. So today I'm announcing a one-off uh, contribution to help sporting clubs with sporting fields on council land with their water costs. Uh, council will be providing a grant or a rebate of up to $5,000 for eligible clubs to help them with their water bills at this time. Uh, the reason this is coming in is because of this dry spell that we're experiencing right now and the mounting costs on sporting clubs at a time when they need it the least. We're going into summer. We're going into the time when people want to be out playing sports, people want to be using these fields, and they don't want to be playing on a dust bowl. These fields also, if you let them run down to a certain point, the cost of getting them back up and running again is very high. You see the rehabilitation costs for sporting fields, once they dry out and they lose, uh, they lose that um, standard of surface that we would expect, um, it is very expensive to bring them back up to the right standard again. So through this, uh, through this rebate, up to $5,000, we will be providing a rebate of uh, up to 50 per cent on the QUU water charges. Now, Council, as everyone knows, is a shareholder, one of five different councils in QUU. Uh, we're involved in that water re retail business once the state government took out the bulk water. The majority of the bill, around 65 per cent of water bills, is actually based on the state government bulk water charge. We don't have control over that. But what we're doing is taking what we do have control over, taking what we do have an influence over, and trying to help out at a time when these clubs need it the most. The other thing we'll be doing is rolling out at least 100 smart water meters to uh, clubs that are using a large amount of water. And these water meters can really help when it comes to detecting unusual use. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this was in a school. The Good News Lutheran College discovered a toilet system that was stuck in the flush position. This was costing around $800 a week 
in excess water usage. Uh, the use of a smart water meter would identify this kind of problem straight away, help them get onto it, help them fix it, and help reduce the water bills. So we're helping clubs as well through this program to become more sustainable and to identify unusual water use as well. So I think this is something that we can do at this time when it's very dry, we're having this record dry spell uh, to help out in the lead up to summer when people want to be out enjoying our parks and sporting fields, playing sport and getting active and healthy as part of our vision for an active and healthy community. Uh, so we'll be riding out to uh, the sporting clubs as soon as possible to let them know about how the program Lord will Mayor, work and eligibility requirements. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. My question is the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, in a recent radio interview, your deputy said repeatedly that this council's plan for five new green bridges was all about getting people out of cars. Yet minutes later, Councillor Adams said the so-called green bridge plan for Balbowrie may end up being open to cars, just like any other bridge. Presumably, presumably then, this so-called green bridge will be open to trucks, which can come from the Ipswich side of the river and run through suburbs such as Balbowrie. Isn't a so-called green bridge that carries cars and trucks what is more commonly referred to as just a bridge? And won't this lead to traffic chaos on Balbowrie's quiet streets? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor, coming for the question. <laughs> Look, <laughs> nice try, a nice try. Um, we can see um, he's thinking, oh, it's a great opportunity for a scare campaign in the western suburbs to whip up some opposition, because they're all about standing in the way of things and stopping things. They're all they're all about opposing infrastructure projects rather than supporting them, and they're all about negativity rather than positive plans for the city. What I can say, though, is that right from the beginning, we have made it clear that a potential use for the Belbari to Waco Green Bridge is in emergency situations where that part of Brisbane will be cut off from other areas. Now, we saw with the 2011 floods, literally thousands of residents in that part of Brisbane cut off with no way in and out because the routes in and out were flooded. Now, we see you know, examples right now, like we're seeing over this last weekend, where communities can be cut off as a result of bushfires as well. And in the event of a bushfire in the western suburbs, this is the kind of asset that will help get people in and out safely, and emergency services as well. So fire trucks, ambulances, police vehicles. That's what we're envisaging when it comes to the potential use of this bridge. This is not intended to be a bridge for general traffic at all times of the day. Uh, this is something that will be useful in an emergency because there is an existing issue there um, with access to the rest of the city in times of natural disaster. And we care about those residents and we believe that if there's an opportunity to build a piece of infrastructure which solves multiple problems and deals with multiple challenges, then that's a good outcome for the community. So we will uh, be talking to the residents about uh, what they would like to see in relation to that bridge, but uh, certainly uh, we haven't ever envisaged that this would just be a general traffic bridge. This is all about improving public and active transport access for residents in the western suburbs, connecting uh, bus services into rail services, connecting to the uh, western suburbs bikeway network, uh, and making sure that the residents there have real alternatives when it comes to travel. And we know that if uh, we want to put extra bus services in, uh, in the western suburbs, that those bus services will just get stuck in traffic on Mogul Road, whereas this provides an opportunity to connect them into rail services so that people can do a transfer um, from a high-frequency bus service into a rail service that will get them either uh, to Ipswich, to the west or into the city and connecting with the wider transport network. It's all about providing new connections and Labor should be ashamed of themselves for trying to manufacture a scare campaign. Further questions? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, last month the Global Livability Index for 2019 was released. While Brisbane's position improved by four spots on last year out of the top 44 cities in the world, Brisbane scored the worst in infrastructure. Can you please outline to the Chamber what Council is doing to better improve this score? Deputy Mayor. 
Thank you, Councillor Davis, for the question, because I am very excited to stand here. And I think the most important part to note out of that question is that Brisbane did rise from 22nd to 18 in the livable cities by The Economist on the global livability scale this year. And that is a fantastic effort, but it is not done by not doing hard work. This effort is about what this administration has been doing, and it is certainly paying off. We have been delivering markets, festivals, events. We have been constructing major bikeways, keeping Brisbane clean, green and sustainable. Most of all, we are focused on one thing, that the Brisbane of tomorrow is guaranteed to be better than the Brisbane of today. And it's because of those efforts that we are so glad to be in the top 20 now, 18th in the world, most livable in the city. However, we are still fifth when it comes to capital cities in Australia. Where is this coming from? The main place we saw the jump, and this is very interesting, the main jump came out of cultural and our environment score. More to see and do, clean and green. We went up from 93.5 up to 96.3. We have now surpassed Perth and Adelaide on cultural and environment livability. Well done, Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner. We also scored the same as all the other cities in health and education, 100 out of 100. We also scored the same on stability, 95 out of 100. But there is the one criteria that is letting us down, and that is infrastructure. Our capital city got an 85.7 only out of 100. Adelaide got 96.4, Perth, Melbourne, Sydney, 100 out of 100. Very, very disappointing. But you know what? Through you, Mr Chair, not very surprising because what do we need for us to reach a higher score in infrastructure? We need some infrastructure. Thank you, Councillor Marks. I'll take the interjection. We would love the metro. We would love the Cross River Rail. We would love to see all of those transport infrastructure that hopefully the Olympic bid will bring, the fast rail to the scenic rim up to the Sunshine Coast. But what do we get from this state government? Absolutely zero. Shame. Absolutely zero. They are so caught up in changing the voting laws, making sure that council's ability to actually get on with business is stymied, and redrawing electoral boundaries for 170,000 people when it only needed to be done for 800, that they can't be bothered to give us a tick to get the heck on with the metro and build the infrastructure, which would put us in the top 10 of the livable cities in the world. Last week, for goodness sakes, last week, the planning minister who gave us money to do the business case for the Kangaroo Point Bridge, an infrastructure project that will take over 5,000 pedestrian crossings a day, will take tens of thousands of cars off the Story Bridge alone, it was more important for Minister Dick that the super yachts could still get up the river, okay. that the state government could still get buckets of cash for parking private yachts on the river rather than delivering delivering infrastructure to get people around this city. Aye. We know we're out of cash. We know 42 per cent of their budget is staffing costs, but it's about time where they stop, start, stop thinking about themselves and start thinking about the people of Brisbane and Queenslander. It is no wonder we have the worst infrastructure score out of the top 44 cities in the world. We are the lowest on infrastructure because nothing has been done. This administration here is doing everything it can in its power to make sure we can build the infrastructure we need. We are shovel ready for the metro. We have had it budgeted for 18 months. It's a state government job. It's a state government responsibility, but we're willing to do it because we are sick and tired of the bottlenecks. We are delivering Wynnum Road, Green Camp Road, Telegraph Road. We are easing congestion through the suburbs. We are going to build Kangaroo Point Bridge, no matter how many private yachts can't park up the river. And we want to get on with Metro, even though the state government has still not paid us the $10 million given to them by the federal government earlier this year, specifically to get the depot started in Eight Mile Plains. I'm sure it's boosting their numbers somewhere. We will continue to work on this. 
I think the state camp, ca government is campaigning harder about pets on city cats and banning smoking in parks than they are on anything that is delivering infrastructure for this city. Councillor in the Adams, absence of any alternative, expired. Team Schrinner is getting on with the work. Councillor, Councillor Johnston. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, it's a really simple one. What is the travel time saving or detriment for drivers along Coonan Street in Indrapilly from either of the two draft proposals for the Mogul Road roundabout upgrade? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, I understand that um, Councillor Johnston has put this question on notice and also posed it to the project team. I understand that uh, Councillor Johnston will be getting briefed in the near future, if she hasn't already, uh, by the project team. Um, and I would appreciate it if Councillor Johnston would support good infrastructure projects, because uh, it, it, it is fascinating when you Point hear— of order. Point of order. Councillor Johnston. Meetings local laws require the Lord Mayor to answer the question, not debate it. The question was, what is the travel time saving or detriment for drivers on Coonan Street? I'd like to know, as would my residents. Well, I can tell you this project will save lives. <laughs> and travel time savings are part of the equation, but they're not the only part. We do road upgrades to improve safety as well as to improve capacity, and we intend to do both when it comes to this particular intersection. But does anyone else remember when I talked about the Indrapilly Roundabout project having some kind of uh, benefit or impact on um, her residents, and she denied that it would, it would do anything. Yeah. Remember? She was like, what's that got to do with anything? Um, so we've, we've had discussion in this chamber where Councillor Johnson said it's not important, but now suddenly it's the most important thing we're talking Mr. about. Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Just on relevance, I'm also interested in a direct answer to the question, what's the trouble time saving? Um, um, the Lord Mayor is answering the question. There's still substantial time left, uh, and there's a great amount of detail being put forward. So, Lord yep, Mayor, thank you. Uh, so we've had the we've had the discussion in this chamber, which we all distinctly remember, where I was saying you need to fix the bottleneck, which will then have flow-on benefits um, to a much wider area. And and Councillor Johnson laughed at the time. She was like, "Nah, won't do anything." Now it is the most important project in her area, according to um, her efforts in recent days. So, uh, Councillor Johnson's position has been has been all over the place. And as I said, you will get briefed on this. Yes, I don't have that information handy right now, but you will get briefed, uh, just as uh, you have requested. And it is important for residents to have a say on this. This is exactly why we're doing consultation exactly why we're doing. And if you look at the list of 15 questions that Councillor Johnston posed, they are, in many respects, the type of questions that you uh, have at the end of the process when you've completed detailed design mm -hmm. um, and when you've gone through this consultation process. We have just kicked off this consultation process. We are looking at this point at two concepts that we've gone out to the community with. And Councillor Johnson wants to know how many seconds the traffic lights will go for on each cycle. I mean, ludicrous questions at this point of the process. And uh, Councillor Johnson is quite clearly trying to stir her residents up against a project uh, that will be good for her area and good for the western suburbs in general, and a project that, as I said, will save lives, a project that will stop accidents from occurring at an intersection where we not only experience major congestion, but we have had serious accidents over a significant period of time. So we will continue to do the consultation with the community. I encourage Councillor Johnston to in, uh, engage in this positively so that we can get a good outcome for everyone out of this process, uh, rather than uh, taking the approach which she seems to be, which is trying to suggest she's being denied information uh, that is not readily available this time. Answers will be heard in silence. It, it's always the same. There's always some big conspiracy theory. There's always some big uh, secret cover-up. There's a conspiracy around every corner. I'll tell you what's happening. We're going out to the community and we're consulting. We haven't locked in the final plans yet. So many of those questions cannot be answered at this point in time. And that is normal at this stage of the process. So, uh, Councillor Johnson, please engage positively. Uh, we will get a good outcome, not only for uh, Councillor Mackay's residents and Councillor Richard's residents, but also for your residents as well. 
That's our aim here, uh, because we want to see as many people as possible benefiting from this important Councilor, infrastructure Johnston, upgrade. Please, you, you've, you've interjected all the, the virtually the entire length of that response. Please be considerate of others. Further questions, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Hammond, September marks Save the Koala Month across Australia. How is this administration working to make Brisbane Australia's koala capital and preserving green space for generations to come? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Councillor Richards, for the question. As we all know, the koala is one of Australia's most loved and iconic animals. In Brisbane and many other parts of Australia, sadly, their numbers are dropping rapidly due to habitat loss, dog attacks, vehicle strikes and disease. As koalas are listed as a vulnerable, um, vulnerable under the national and state environmental law, Brisbane City Council is helping to protect Brisbane's koalas in numerous ways by carrying out land use planning, purchasing privately owned land with significant koala habitat through the bushland acquisition program. We've established a koala fodder plantation at Waco to provide wildlife carers with a secure food source for sick or injured koalas in the greater Brisbane area. Planting koala food trees on council land, such as through the Habitat Brisbane program and through our Creek Catchment program. Assisting residents to protect and restore koala habitat through the Wildlife Conservation Partnership program. Installing, which I know, Councillor Richards, you've got, wildlife movement um, solutions um, around our busy koala corridors providing information and advice to Brisbane residents and visitors on how to protect koalas, managing pest plants and animals that impact them, and managing natural areas such as Brisbane koala bushlands, where residents and visitors can see koalas. We offer wildlife carer grants and environmental grants to undertake a city-wide koala surveys using the services of our koala detection dogs. This work has valuable information about current population numbers, movement behaviours and the health of our koalas. But everybody needs to play a role in protecting our koalas. So, Mr Chair, here are a few things that you and other residents can do. If you see an injured koala, um, please call the medical emergencies. <clears throat> Phone the RSPCA on 1300 Animal. If you live in a koala habitat area or a movement corridor, drive carefully, slow down, look out for koalas in those peak dawn and dusk movement periods. Plant koala food trees. <clears throat> Some of the recognised trees are the grey gum, um, the scribbly gum, their favourite, of course, is the blue gum, but there's about 10 other species across that koalas find desirable. More, very important for our residents across Brisbane, provide koala-friendly fencing. Make sure your swimming pool is koala safe. Keep koalas away from your animals, especially dogs. Watch koalas from a distance. We don't have to go up as people are very tempted to do when they see a koala because we love them so much in this city of ours. We don't have to go up and touch the koala or make it deter from its natural course where it was going. If you have more than 0.45 hectares of land, um, you can create or protect your own wildlife conservation and you can join our conservation partnership program and receive assistance by rehabilitating or planting some of these um, areas for our koalas to live. Remember that by protecting koalas, you will also be protecting a range of other species. We continue to work with the experts in this field, including Lone Pine and the Koala Research Institute, and we're working with the two universities to come up with why, where are the koalas moving? What diseases are they having? We are tracking 
um, our koala movements across this city. Mr Chair, this side of the chamber take it very seriously in protecting our wildlife, especially our koalas. And unfortunately, there is too many koala deaths from dog attacks, from car strikes. That's why we are purchasing, like no other administration before, privately owned habitat areas to keep our koalas safe and keep them in our city. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. My question is the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, an April 6, 2019 report into claims airport link had worsened flooding in the Kedron Book and Eagle Junction Creek catchments refers to a letter personally signed by former Mayor Graham Quirk telling how he directed council engineers to investigate the issue as a matter of priority. More than 70 households are said to be directly affected by an issue that has driven insurance premiums sky high and potentially threatened their major investment, their home. Residents have also produced a 2016 letter from Councillor Quirk saying it had been advised flood levels had risen since Airport Link was built. In response, your spokesperson said, an export report from the Airport Link con contractors verified that there had been no increase in flood levels in the area since the Airport Link project. This is Caesar judging Caesar and hardly an independent assessment. Can you help these desperate Brisbane residents clear up the mess that has been thrust upon them by immediately releasing the independent report ordered by your predecessor, Graham Quirk? Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cumming, for the question. There's uh, an important part missing from your question, which is the fact that Airport Link is a state government project. And it, apparently everything's our fault. Everything that happens in Brisbane is our fault. Nothing is the state government's fault. It's always, it's always Brisbane City Council's fault. Um, so, you know, it, 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 yeah, who was the minister at the time? Sterling Hinchliffe, the guy that he's taken the knife to local government across the state right. and, and wants to make his legacy um, the uh, un, undue interference in um, local government for purely political reasons. That's what's going on here. But he did leave another legacy, uh, which was he was involved in Airport Link when it was under construction. And I know Councillor uh, Hammond was uh, in regular contact with um, the minister at, at, in his role with concerns about Airport Link and about the construction impacts of that project. Uh, but let's not rewrite history here. This project has nothing to do with Brisbane City Council other than one thing. One thing, we proposed it in the first place. The state government thought it was a great idea and they went on and built it. Good on them. Good on them because it is important infrastructure that is being used uh, not only by motorists and freight each day, but it also helped deliver a part of the Northern Busway. We only wish that they delivered the rest of the Northern Busway as well. Uh, but if Councillor Cumming has concerns about airport link, go and talk to your mates up in George Street. It is nothing to do with council. And if there's concerns about what was done or what wasn't done, then go and talk to them about it. Pick up the phone, Stop trying to play politics with this, because the reality is flooding of properties has been an issue for a lot longer than Airport Link has been around. I remember as a kid going to Toomble and seeing the sign saying, uh, you know, um, don't park in this car park in case it rains. If you go into the movies and um, there's a, a rain shower, you better come back and get your car quickly because it'll get washed down the creek. Yeah. So this is not an issue that has suddenly popped up. There has been uh, concerns about flooding in this area long before airport link was ever Point of built. order. Point of order, Councillor Cumming. Point of order. The question was uh, whether the Lord Mayor would immediately release the independent report ordered by his predecessor, Graham Quirk. I'm yet to hear an answer to that question. Lord Mayor, to the substance of the matter, please. Uh, I, I am not aware of any such report, and I think he's making it up. I think Councillor Cumming is making it up because I've seen no such report. And why would this Lord Mayor or a former Lord Mayor order a report into a state government project that we have nothing to do with, that we didn't build? It's not our project. Why would we do that? So look, stop trying to play politics with this issue, Councillor Cumming. If you have a concern, raise it with your colleagues at the state government level. That's where it is appropriate. It is a state government project and uh, you should raise those concerns with the state government. 
This is not a council project uh, and I am not aware of any such reports. I have not seen any such reports and all of the information that I am aware of is that uh, any issues with flooding are a matter for the state government to address. Further questions? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Finance and Administration Committee, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen, Council's disaster preparedness program has been finalised in preparation for the summer season. Can you outline what Council's responsibilities are in regards to getting residents ready for summer's unpredictable weather? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank uh, Councillor McLaughlin for the question. Clearly, this question is more relevant and important than ever, with the bushfire season already having a significant impact in Queensland. Right now, there is something in the order of 80 fires burning across Queensland and more in northern New South Wales. I did uh, want to take a moment to acknowledge the people in and near the areas of Stanthorpe, Binnaburra, Sarabar, Canungra and now Perigian Beach, whose properties and lives have been devastated by the recent fires. I'd also like to make special mention of the hard work of firefighters, SES and volunteers who have been working round the clock to manage and protect the residents of South East Queensland. Mm -hmm. Brisbane and Queensland is an enviable place to live with an average temperature of 27 degrees and an average of eight hours of sun sunshine a day, and we are surrounded by beautiful hinterlands and beaches. We really are a lifestyle city. However, the beautiful weather and scenery does come with some risks, including bushfires and extreme weather events. Whether it's bushfire events in the hot dry seasons, as we are seeing across the state now, or the cyclones and storms we experienced closer to summer that resulted in more than $1 billion worth of damage in 2014. This is why Council, with funding through the state government's Get Ready Queensland program, conducts a series of community engagements to encourage Brisbane residents and businesses to be prepared for fires and severe weather events. Council's Be Prepared program runs all year round with a focus on storm, cyclone and bushfire seasons, as well as heatwave risks. This includes educating Brisbane residents on the consequences of extreme events such as flooding or fire and the potential, potential damage to property. Here in Brisbane, we can expect extreme weather almost any time of the year, and especially in spring and summer. This is why we run our campaign throughout the year, ensuring that we are always getting the message out there to Brisbane residents to be prepared. As a matter of business as usual, Council's disaster management team ensure we, still, sorry, we have stalls at a number of events throughout the year, including Council events and the Brisbane Home Show. In addition, Council holds approximately five street meets a year, which are targeted at communities that are at highest risk. For example, leading into bushfire season, Council will set up street meets in areas such as the Gap or Kenmore. This financial year, Council is conducting street meets in Wynnum, Sandgate and the Gap, with a focus on storm and flood preparedness. In one year alone, Council will hold more than 80 face-to-face -face engagements with residents on how to be prepared for different weather events. In order to get our message out there, Council also conducts a series of advertising and marketing campaigns, which includes TV advertisements, radio and billboard campaigns. Everyone would have seen the signs or advertisements with the message very clear, know your risk and be prepared. In the last few months, Council has been busy conducting bushfire prevention with hazard reduction burns completed over 206 hectares in our major bushland areas with more than 110 firefighters used to undertake these planned burns. As we can see across the state, the bushfire risk is not over, and we will continue to educate residents on how to prevent and prepare for bushfires. Now, as we enter spring, we are also preparing for our Storm Ready campaign. Residents can expect to see more advertising across the city on radio and TV on how to prepare for storm, um, storm events and also how to uh, manage these, particularly around the impact of um, clogged gutters and overhanging branches. Our message to residents is that no matter what severe weather events occur, talk to members of your household, develop an emergency and evacuation plan, 
which includes your pets, and be prepared to execute that plan in the event of a major, major disaster. While the bushfires are not directly impacting us here in Brisbane, there are things residents can do to minimise the risk, such as I mentioned keeping gutters uh, clear, making sure that debris and um, fuel load around your houses is cleared, and ensuring that um, your access routes are also clear. To ease the burden on residents, Council is offering free waste reduction and rate waste removal um, uh, over the weekends of the 21st and 22nd of September, uh, the 5th and 6th of October, and the 19th and uh, 20th Councilor of October. Allen, your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. My question to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, opposition councillors have been told more than 20 businesses have closed along Racecourse Road during the life of your ill-planned Kingsford Smith Drive debacle. Traders have also told the opposition they have been informed Racecourse Road would reopen to traffic off Kingsford Smith Drive in March, which they say is crucial to their survival. However, another crippling blow to small business in the area, now they have been informed the road will stay closed until May. Can you inform the Chamber when cars will be able to turn into Racecourse Road off Kingsford Smith Drive so that these poor small business people can have some certainty over their future? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Cumming, for the question. There is no doubt that uh, major infrastructure projects do have uh, impacts while they're being constructed, um, and that is the case whether it's Kingston Smith Drive, whether it's Cross River Rail, whether it's Airport Link, other projects. There, there is, it is a fact of life that there are impacts. And obviously, that's something that Council works with the contractor to try and minimise and manage. Uh, but you can't build anything major uh, in a city like Brisbane without there being some impacts. And so I understand uh, the interest of local business in this project, and I understand their desire to see it finished off. Um, what I don't understand, though, is Labor's approach on this project, because their approach is to do nothing, to build nothing and just to oppose for political reasons and to try and politicise everything and to try and politicise issues that simply shouldn't be politicised, uh, and this is one of them. Now, I was out there with Councillor uh, Adams, Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Howard, Councillor uh, Adam Allen at the Ascot Small Business Forum just the other day. Uh, it was a very widely publicised small business forum, and I was, I, I must admit, expecting this issue to come up prominently amongst those small business operators. I uh, delivered a short introduction um, and then I opened the floor up to questions. I did not receive one single question uh, about this particular project or one single complaint. Yes, people want to see it finished. Yes, uh, the sooner the better. I understand that. And yes, that is what we're uh, working towards as well. Uh, but council would never intentionally or deliberately do something uh, to harm or affect a small business. Uh, with a major project like this. We try and manage those impacts uh, and we've been working hard and we put a lot of pressure on our contractor uh, to do the best job possible. And that also involves us uh, from time to time intervening to say, well, we need to do more. And that has happened on a number of occasions with uh, things like improved or changed signage uh, with, when it comes to uh, consultation and engagement with local business people. That is something that we are determined to make sure that we continue to do and continue to improve. Uh, so we are always open to feedback about how we can do better, uh, but uh, Council is absolutely working hard to make sure we minimise these impacts. But I can tell you, uh, if Labor had their way, uh, the people in that part of Brisbane would be stuck in traffic permanently. There would be no end in sight because Labor's approach is to do nothing. Labor's approach is to do nothing and to oppose major infrastructure projects. And whether it's the Kings of Smith Drive upgrade, where they went to the last election uh, opposing it, or whether it's Brisbane Metro, where they are doing everything Councilor, possible to stand in the way. Silence, Lord Mayor. Or whether it's even state government projects like Airport Link that they're trying to blame us for. I mean, next day we'll be complaining that Cross River Rail is causing flooding in a particular area and it's our fault. That's, right. That's what's coming next. The reality is, according to Labor, everything's our fault. 
Um, and according to Labor, nothing should be done when it comes to infrastructure, which is why the Deputy Mayor rightly pointed out that Brisbane has been lagging, because this mob and their friends up in George Street are doing everything possible to stand in the way of good projects that need to happen. Why? Because they're too gutless to make decisions, they're too gutless to get on with the job, and all they want to do is oppose. We know what happens when this mob gets in. Nothing. Nothing happens. Councillors. Nothing happens. Councillor Griffiths, you have, um, you in particular are particularly audible, and you're repeating yourself. Um, please limit your interjections. And not only Point do they order. slow down their own projects, they Point slow down other you. people's projects as Point well. Order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yes, I can clearly hear Councillor Adams interjecting very loudly then as well, and I draw your attention to her contravention of the standing orders. Thank you. I didn't being. hear Councillor Adams uh, saying anything. But the, the reality is we are determined to get on with the job of upgrading our city's infrastructure and building the infrastructure our city needs for the future. Uh, that is a big part of making sure that the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. If we stop when it comes to infrastructure, if we stay still, we go backwards. The city is growing. The region is growing. These major projects not only benefit Brisbane residents, but residents from around the region, from other councils as well, and they certainly benefit uh, the state of Queensland as a whole, given that we're the capital. And so we're keen to get on with the job. We're keen to build things. We will keep doing that. That is our record, and our record shows that we build things. These projects are always complicated. They're never easy. There are impacts, and we do our best to manage them. But what we're thinking about is the long-term future of our city, because the businesses in Racecourse Road and other parts of Brisbane, they'll have all types of trouble if people are sitting in gridlock on Kingston Smith Drive permanently Lord Mayor, your time Labor has stood in the way. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Further questions, Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Hammond, public consultation on the revitalisation of Victoria Park is now well underway. Can you please give us an update on the feedback received from residents and other ways residents can have their say? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Mackay, for the question, because this would happen to be probably my most favourite project that's happening in this city. And thank you to this Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, who is delivering the biggest park ever delivered in this city for 50 years. There has been over 1,100 Brisbane residents that have been sharing their ideas with Brisbane's biggest park. Um, we also have connected with five top designers in Brisbane who have given their vision for what they see the potential of this park to be. Let me assure you these are visions. These were to, um, designed for people to have sparked interest, have a look outside the box and see what this world-class park will deliver. I would like to thank Active Forests by Urbis for their designs, Nature and Nurtures, Health and Wellbeing by Conrad Gargett, Barambin, which is Reconnection and um, Restoration by play, um, of Place by LAT 27, Rock Pools, very ambitious idea, but thank you very much, um, by Place Design Group, and Celebrate and Connect by Track Consultants. We have now received some great feedback, with nearly 10,000 people visiting the site with 330 unique ideas received. This is a park for all of Brisbane. This is a park that will be on world stage. This is a park that people overseas are already talking about what Brisbane's doing. I encourage all councillors to come to the Vic Party on the 22nd of September, where people can engage again. The white marquee will be all about have your say. For those people like myself, which will take the option, there will be six eight-seater buggies going around the site so people can actually walk on without getting hit by a golf ball and have a look at what this site can actually be. There's going to be four posts around the site so people can get a passport, go around to the four different posts, um, have a look at the unique views that Victoria Park has, get it stamped, put it in to the, um, the draw to win some fabulous prizes. We have already had some great public consultations with Councillor Matic 
um, at the Urban Village and also down at the markets with Councillor Howard. People are excited about this new project. I'm excited about this new project, and I'm proud to stand on this side of the chamber with this Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, who had the vision to open up this beautiful park, the biggest park ever in 50 years, to be delivered to the people of Brisbane, the visitors for Brisbane, and come along. I look forward to seeing every single one of you on the 22nd of September and have your say about this beautiful, green, unique um, development that we're going to see at Victoria Park. Thank you. Councillors, that concludes question time. Uh, I draw your attention to the consideration of committee reports. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Just really quickly, I just want to note for the record that in the last two question times, the opposition councillors have had eight questions and only one out of those eight has been to the Greens. So I just want that noted for future meetings. Thank you. Councillors, I um, draw your attention to... Uh, point of order. Yeah, point Mr. of order. Yeah. Um, Councillor Johnston. Yes, I, I, I support Councillor Shree's point of order here, and I'm, I would ask why you're not abiding by uh, the meeting's local law, which require you to pro rata questions uh, to opposition and other councillors. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. I, uh, Councillor Shree and I have discussed this, and I believe that I am allocating questions pro rata. Uh, I move dissent in your ruling, given that you are not um, allowing questions to be allocated fairly to all councillors. There is dissent in uh, my statement uh, moved by Councillor Johnston. Is there a seconder? There is no seconder. Thank you, everybody. Again, councillors, I draw to your attention the Establishment and Coordination Committee report. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I move that the, the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 2nd of September 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting <laughs> dated Monday, the 2nd of September 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate, Lord Mayor? Uh, yes, Mr Chair. Uh, firstly, I wanted to put on the record on behalf of, I'm sure, all councillors. Um, my thanks and gratitude for the firefighters and emergency service workers who have been doing such an incredible job across Queensland under incredibly difficult cir circumstances. I also want to place on the record our, uh, the fact that our heart goes out and our sympathy, sympathy is with uh, the residents that have lost property uh, or animals um, at this time in the terrible bushfires. Um, and it certainly it's something that uh, focuses the mind right now about all the different types of things that can happen when you live in Queensland, uh, whether it's fires or whether it's storms or whether it's floods. Uh, so we are grateful for the community spirit that's been displayed. We are grateful for the professionalism and hard work of our emergency service workers and also for the volunteer hours that are being put in uh, by groups like SES as well across the state right now. Uh, we are fortunate at this point uh, not to have had any significant fires in Brisbane, in the Brisbane City Council area, um, touch wood. Um, it is uh, something where I understand there were a couple of minor fires that broke out within Brisbane uh, in the last 24 hours, but they were quickly put out uh, and they didn't cause any significant harm or damage. Uh, so the- Councillor Johnston, please. The Lord Mayor. <laughs> I, I'm talking about bushfires, obviously. Um, I, am, I am aware that there have been some house fires as well, and obviously um, uh, the, the sentiments I expressed earlier uh, relate also to those circumstances, but uh, those circumstances were not related to bushfires, I understand. The sentiment is the same. We are grateful and we are thankful um, at this time, and we certainly will continue to do everything we can as a council to back up uh, our SES workers and to work closely with um, other levels of government when it comes to the police and the fireys and the ambulance uh, workers as well. This week, uh, we will be again lighting up uh, our major iconic assets in support of great community causes. Um, and so Victoria Bridge, City Hall, Redcliffe Place and the Tropical Dome as well as the Sandgate Town Hall will be uh, lit up pink to celebrate the Brisbane Festival, which is uh, now underway and, and obviously a great uh, celebration 
uh, for the people of Brisbane and one of our largest, if not the largest, uh, festivals across the state. Uh, it, is, it is now attracting an audience of around one million people, which is just incredible. Um, so something we should all be proud of. Uh, be sure to check out the uh, spectacular River of Light, Water Fountain, Light and Laser Show on the river in the uh, South Bank Cultural <laughs> Forecourt from uh, Tuesday through to Sunday at 6.15 p.m., 8 p.m. and again at 9 p.m. Uh, and also we turn off the lights on Victoria Bridge um, during those shows to make sure people can um, get the best view uh, without any light spilling across. On Tuesday, uh, sorry, today, uh, the Story Bridge will be lit up in blue to support uh, World Suicide Prevention Day. Uh, and it provides an opportunity to raise awareness of this uh, significant community issue and something that I know that we all care very deeply about. Uh, moving forward, uh, I mentioned the uh, small business forum that we had uh, at, out at Ascot recently. Um, it was great to see so many members of the local community and so many small business people turning up. And we're seeing that increasingly as we move around the city with these small business forums. Uh, people are really engaging. Small business is active and interested and involved, and they want to work even more closely with council uh, so that we can uh, all be on the same page in supporting the growth of small business in our, uh, in our city and supporting the jobs and other economic benefits and social benefits that come with successful small business. And so we'll continue to do what we can to support our small businesses and obviously we have now uh, the $2 million fee reduction package in effect uh, that came through this council chamber uh, fairly recently and is something that is now rolling out in support of small businesses across Brisbane. Uh, we also um, saw a fantastic uh, several events on the weekend, um, whether it was the Green Heart Fair and Brisbane Billy Cart Championships out of Carindale, uh, or whether it was the Nunda Village Street Festival. Um, it, it was an absolutely fantastic event. And then later on that afternoon, uh, the uh, great uh, community or family fun day um, out in the Jamboree Ward with Councillor Burke. Um, and thank you to Councillor Burke for uh, making me and also my family feel welcome at that event. And uh, it was great to see the amazing community spirit at both uh, that event and the Nunda Festival as well. And it was great to see the passion that people have for sustainability and the work that we're doing uh, to make Brisbane more sustainable at the Green Heart Fair uh, on Sunday. Moving to the uh, formal items on the agenda, we have in item A, the significant contracting plan for ferry and ferry infrastructure operations and maintenance services. And this begins the process um, to source a provider to operate our fleet of city cats and also uh, mono hull ferries. As councillors are well aware, Transdev currently run the service and they have done so since 2010. Uh, and the uh, contract expires on the 4th of November next year, 2020. So we're starting the process to make sure we go out to market and source a operator going forward for our popular city cats and city ferry services and as, as well as the city hopper. We know that um, more than 5 million trips have been taken on our ferries uh, each year, and this is a significant and important contract for the city. There are a total of 30 vessels and 25 ferry terminals which fall under the remit of this contract, and so the successful provider will need to not only operate the vessels themselves, but also uh, provide uh, some maintenance of the uh, ferry terminals as well, and monitoring of those ferry terminals too. <laughs> Uh, market research has shown that contracts, contract terms for this type of contract are typically between seven and 15 years. Uh, as such, council has opted for a five plus five plus five uh, contract in going out to market. We'll be accepting tenders uh, until the close of business on the 20th of November this year. And uh, I know that there is a, at this point, a significant level of interest out there in operating Brisbane's iconic ferries. Uh, item B is the Westpac Master Operating Lease Rental Facility. Uh, and Council is uh, seeking to extend the existing operating lease with Westpac for our bus fleet. Uh, 
Council's bus fleet consists of uh, 1,225 buses, of which 729 are leased with Westpac and 305 are leased with the Commonwealth Bank. The current lease facility is due to expire, uh, was due to expire on the 30th of June 2019. Um, Council of West and Westpac agreed to extend the lease for a further 12 months on the same terms. Uh, this re uh, represents value for money for Brisbane, uh, as, in, as indicative pricing and the terms in the current market are higher than this facility. So, uh, in long story short, if we went out to market with this lease, uh, we would be paying more than what we are paying at the moment. So, obviously, uh, in delivering a uh, modern bus fleet uh, with our continued ongoing renewal program of that bus fleet, uh, this facility allows us to continue providing those op operations and it also uh, allows us to con continue to allocate capital to other more important priorities uh, rather than having it tied up in a bus fleet. So uh, we can continue to operate the bus fleet as we have always done uh, and freeing up and with this lease we're freeing up capital to invest in uh, major infrastructure upgrades. As councillors would be aware our bus fleet is now 100% air conditioned and wheel wheelchair accessible uh, and uh, we are going through an ongoing process of renewing and upgrading that bus fleet as well uh, through our current arrangement which involves uh, the buses being uh, assembled uh, right here in Eagle Farm in a joint arrangement with Volgren. Item C on the agenda is the major amendment to Brisbane City Plan, uh, package E. Uh, as the Chamber is no doubt aware, it is uh, through amendments to City Plan that Council ensures uh, planning decisions continue to be updated to reflect community expectations. Uh, and in this particular case, um, Council undertook public consultation on the proposed amendment, Package E, from the 5th of March to the 12th of April 2019. The proposed amendment includes changes across a range of citywide provisions, including facilitating car share arrangements, uh, changes to waterway corridors, changes to zoning, overlay mapping, major transport infrastructure, subdivision and multiple dwellings, to name a few. Council received 37 submissions, of which Lord 36... Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. Move for an extension. Seconded. Extension of time has been moved by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Richards. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Please continue. <clears throat> Uh, Council received 37 submissions during the public consultation period, of which 36 were properly made. Uh, they have been given full consideration in the context of uh, these amendments. Uh, some changes were made as a result of this public input. However, the changes uh, have not made the amendment significantly different to the version taken to public consultation, which means we can now progress to the next step without going back to square one again. Uh, many submissions were in support of the proposed changes uh, and with the uh, endorsement of the Chamber, uh, a summary of matters considered from public consultation will be sent to the Queensland Government, who will also undertake a final state interest check. Once the Queensland Government is finished with that process, it will come back to the Chamber for uh, final approval, including adoption and gazettal. Uh, item D is the resumption of land for road purposes at 610 Miles Plutting Road, Rochdale. Uh, this is obviously um, to help facilitate infrastructure upgrades in uh, the growing area of Rochdale. Uh, and uh, this is one of many properties that we have acquired uh, to help facilitate uh, infrastructure and road upgrades. It's not only about the road upgrades, it's also about uh, the footpath and bikeway upgrades and drainage upgrades that come with those. Uh, important works and uh, so we're getting on with the job of making sure we upgrade the Rochdale road network to help facilitate all the growth that's going on in the area. Subject property is 3,045 uh, 3, metres square. Council only requires 210 metres of land at uh, one at the frontage of the property to accommodate those upgrades. Uh, the road network obviously is progressively being upgraded and this is one of the last sections along that section of Miles Plutting Road that need to be uh, purchased and upgraded. Moving forward to item E, the uh, 
the report of Council's contracts uh, for July 2019. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, I draw your attention to item E on the um, uh, report before us today and the addendum marked commercial incompetence information. There are two addendums. Uh, clause A relates to uh, the uh, ferry item in item A. And item E, addendum clause E on page two, is the entirety of the contracts and tendering report. Um, there's no indication in the addendum which aspects of that uh, report are actually redacted. Um, you can see a similar sentence in clause A, which is not included in clause B. Now, I did raise this with the CEO's office earlier today, and they think there's been a mistake, um, but there is one tiny section of the contracts and tendering uh, report, which is related to contract eight, and there's a figure in contract eight on page four. So, Mr Chairman, my question is, you are responsible for ensuring uh, which information is commercial incompetence and which is not. Will you please confirm for the chamber now that the rest of the information in the contract report is not commercial incompetence as provided in the council papers before us. So, councillors, what Councillor Johnston has identified is that um, if you see on your what you see page one, addendum clause A, there is a um, line that says the details shown in bold, underlined and highlighted yellow in this document are commercial incompetence. That should appear on both pages one and two. I've been advised uh, that that was done in error. However, the entirety of the document, wherever you see an item highlighted or well, bold and underlined, I appreciate not everybody has colour, bold and underlined, that is commercial incompetence, the entirety of this uh, addendum that's for items A and E. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Lord Mayor, would you, con would you care to continue, please? <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, just in relation to item E, uh, the contracts and tendering report, uh, the, um, obviously there's been the usual information that's provided, but one thing I wanted to uh, update the chamber on is uh, the progress we've been making to uh, ensure that local companies uh, get a good share of council contracts when it comes to um, our procurement. And uh, for the month of July, I can report um, that following my announcement to have a target of 80% of contracts going to local South East Queensland businesses, um, we achieved in July 89% um, of contracts going to uh, local South East Queensland businesses and Brisbane businesses. So uh, that's, that's good to see and we obviously want to continue uh, that, uh, that run in, in terms of supporting local businesses. We think it is really important. Uh, we also acknowledge that um, just because a business may be slightly outside the city of Brisbane, it might be uh, nearby in, in Redlands or it might be in Logan or it might be in Morton, that there are also benefits for Brisbane uh, in procuring in South East Queensland because workers move across city boundaries um, and the benefits flow across city boundaries as well. So um, having that uh, outcome of 89% of contracts going to local South East Queensland businesses is a great outcome and we'll continue working to make sure we uh, help prioritise local business and support local business through our procurement processes. Uh, Mr Chair, I think that's the last item. Oh no, we've got item, item F, F. Uh, item F, which is the uh, changes to the Suburban Enhancement Fund criteria and guidelines. Obviously, uh, this particular uh, item was all about making sure that councillors, when they're working with communities and council offices to identify priority projects, they have a bit more flexibility to deliver the type of projects they would like to see delivered in their wards. Um, and so we've We've certainly uh, created or delivered a bit more flexibility than councillors have seen in the past. Uh, originally, uh, this fund was all about footpaths, uh, and then it was expanded to parks, uh, and now we've expanded it even further with these guidelines, so that it is truly a suburban enhancement fund, um, and I think that's a good outcome. So each councillor gets an allocation of 562,000 
where they can work, as I said, with the community and with council officers to help identify priority projects, which they can then uh, tap into this fund for uh, going forward, which helps them deliver real benefits and important projects in their local community. So I look forward to seeing uh, the support of all councillors for this particular item. Further speakers, Councillor Cumming. Thanks, Chair. Uh, in relation to the ENC report, item A, uh, we, uh, we have some concerns about this, uh, this contract. Uh, we've seen the current operators, Transdev, in conjunction with, apparently with Councillor Adams, to engaging in some dreadful behaviour, namely installing cameras in the lunchrooms of uh, employees. And uh, this is uh, really sinister big brother behaviour, in my opinion, that should have no place in a modern workforce. Point of order. And, uh, sorry. Point of order to you, Deputy Mayor. And the council is imputing motive. This has been clarified. Yeah, that's right. Please, um, uh, Councillor Cumming, please, um, please, limit your, um, uh, please limit your comments around um, that, that particular matter. Well, Councillor Cumming. She couldn't make up her mind whether she first said staff had uh, requested it and then said transdev, so I'm still not sure which one, which one she says now, but anyhow. Uh, the, uh, yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's grave concern when the council uh, uh, prides itself as being a good employer as well. Uh, the, uh, now, I I've, uh, understand due to uh, pressure, industrial pressure brought on by the Maritime Union and their workforce, uh, and uh, the uh, Transdev have now removed the cameras, and hopefully that sort of thing won't happen again. Uh, and uh, the other issue which needs to be taken into account when considering any tender for the current operator is the uh, standard of maintenance on the uh, uh, council uh, ferry facilities. Uh, the uh, a uh, recent uh, ENC report showed that there was a saving of $5,214,000 uh, under the uh, category of provide ferry services and maintenance, and this was sort of boasted about, but uh, our understanding is that there's uh, considerable maintenance issues with uh, some of the uh, uh, ferry uh, terminals, and uh, the money should have been spent in keeping the uh, the maintenance up to date, and uh, instead it's been uh, allowed to uh, uh, deteriorate, and uh, there's risks of, uh, of, of safety in, in due course, either damage to vessels or uh, uh, other problems as well. Uh, now, uh, Transdev, I believe, also is a uh, foreign multinational, and it repatriates its profit out of Australia as well. So. There's a number of reasons why uh, I guess we'd like to see someone else get this contract, but uh, we, we'll see what uh, council comes up Matt, with. Uh, and the other matter we'd like to see considered is for council to take over the contract. Uh, council runs the bus services in Brisbane, and we can't see why council couldn't tender for the operation of the ferry services. And we call upon the administration to include this as an option. Uh, we're also concerned about the summary of key risks associated with this uh, procurement. Five of the eight procurement risks have a risk rating as high. So we'll continue to keep this uh, plan under close scrutiny until the matter has been finalised. I now turn to Clause D, the resumption of land for road purposes at uh, 610 miles Planning Road, Rochdale. Uh, we accept that given the level of development occurring in this suburb and an upgrade to the road network is required and that, that the 210 metre uh, is being resumed, needs to be resumed. Uh, in relation to item E, the uh, contracts and tendering, uh, forgive me for being a bit parochial with this one, but item five is a very important project for the Winter Manly Ward, a new skateboard facility funded by two years of savings from the Foot Park and Parks Trust Fund, as it was at the time. And uh, I notice uh, $450,000 has been allocated, allocated uh, for the uh, successful tenderer, but the uh, statement that I have in my office reveals that there was $805,000 available, so, uh, in which I was told by council staff was a reasonable amount. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm concerned that, uh, uh, that uh, we're going to get a high quality facility because the money was available to spend more than what the contract has come up with. And the other thing is about the contractor is that uh, they uh, didn't have the highest uh, VFM. They were the second highest and they weren't the cheapest either. But uh, again, staff have told me they're uh, 
a group that have done a number of projects around Brisbane and they considered a very uh, high quality contractor and hopefully that'll be the case as well. The, uh, also being told that the, uh, the project would be finished before the Christmas school holidays and all the kids I've told that are really uh, very, uh, uh, very happy that that's going to be the case. But uh, according to the, uh, the document here, we have it's going to be a 26-week contract from 15th of July, which would take it through to late January. And so hopefully, again, the staff are, uh, are correct in that regard. In relation to contract eight, it's the e-scooter contract, and we're concerned about the. Uh, the level of secrecy in this race and this contract, you know, this is uh, sure. Look, it's a new, it's a new thing. It's a high tech, you know, modern style thing. But so why is it so? Why is it so secretive? Why, why uh, is it such a uh, a matter that needs to be hidden from public gaze as to how much uh, is being uh, spent on these contracts? And uh, the uh, I've, I've got some real concerns about that, and uh, also. Uh, the uh, you know one of the tenderers was very lucky to uh, to be successful uh, uh, with the uh, with their tender as well. Uh, you know people should have had the right to the, the public should know what the dollar amounts involved. The public should know uh, what's what's involved, and it shouldn't be concealed from them. In relation to item F, the suburban enhancement fund policy and associated delegations. Well, um, this takes over from the Ward Footpaths and Parks Trust Fund. Uh, we're a bit wary of this policy. Uh, we've seen in recent uh, times how policies can be abused if the wording is vague and imprecise. And we've seen this with the, uh, the obviously the, bush, the notorious bushland acquisition purchase at the Mount Gravatt East. And uh, we've also uh, seen the uh, problems that have arisen in this place with uh, cab charges uh, used by Councillor Owen. Uh, so it's my view, council should be providing more detail than less with policies on expenditure of ratepayers' money to ensure that the possibility of abuse is minimised. And uh, I really don't think this, uh, this policy achieves that. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a two-page document and the, uh, under the heading application of funds, there is a whole uh, four and a half lines that say the following, the annual amount allocated to each ward under the fund may be expended on physical works for improvements of parks, active transport infrastructure, assets within the road reserve, or community facility infrastructure on council managed land within the wards, etc., and wards across the river. Uh, that is not a lot of detail. That is not a lot of detail. Uh, there's no definitions uh, supplied, so people, uh, you know, councillors are aware, you know, what, uh, what exactly. Uh, uh, is, is involved, and I've got some uh, some real concerns about it. Uh, I feel that a, uh, a list of uh, uh, of uh, possible expenditure could have been provided, and, and it could have been stated that it wasn't a comprehensive list, so that there was more guidance given to councillors in deciding how the money should be spent, rather than. Uh, what will happen with this very broad definition is that there'll be a, a lot of discretion, uh, which will probably end up uh, in the have to be exercised by uh, by the CEO and uh, by uh, by the committee, and uh, so it's it's going to be very uh, very vague, I believe. The other thing that I think is would have been of some benefit, well, would be of some benefit if uh, the, when the matter proceeds, is for. Uh, uh, the, as a policy matter, is to uh, publicise what has been uh, been provided, what has been approved by council, and so that everyone knows what way in which the def the interpretation of the new policy is heading. So uh, I think that'd be a worthwhile thing as well. Uh, the uh, my other concern is, I hate to be cynical, I know that the current administration. Uh, could be using the widening of what the fund can be spent for as an excuse for not financing items in the general council budget. Uh, I give an example of a constituent who uh, heard the Lord Mayor Srinner saying around budget time that council would be funding footpaths near schools. Uh, now, when the constituent wrote to the Lord Mayor asking for a particular footpath to be funded, the Lord Mayor's response was, uh, contact your local councillor to seek funding for the footpath. Now, so the Lord Mayor announced a, a so-called policy 
and then councillors are expected to fund it. Now that's uh, that's rubbish, Madam Chair. That's not sorry, Mr. Chair. That's no way to um, to run uh, things around the city. I made it clear to the constituent I'll be not funding the Lord Mayor's thought bubbles. Uh, footpaths close to schools have always had priority, but it's not the Lord Mayor's place to announce it unless he's going to fund it. So I'd ask the Lord Mayor to make sure he does that. Well, with a bit of luck, he won't have another budget to, to bring down. Uh, finally, we would prefer to see the uh, expenditure for parks delegations as $100,000, which is uh, uh, in the uh, ENC report. Uh, all the other, uh, all the other areas of coming. Your Sorry. time's expired. I move for an extension, Chair. Second. An extension of time has been moved by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Please continue. Thank you. Uh, all the other uh, delegations are uh, $100,000, so it's uh, where expenditure does not exceed $100,000, it's the CEO as the delegate, and where the expenditure is in excess of $100,000, then it's the, the relevant committee. And so we can't see why, uh, why the uh, parks expenditure should be uh, any different to any of the other areas of expenditure. You don't get a lot for uh, $100,000 of uh, parks improvements, and we just think it should, they should be treated the same as uh, everyone else. So uh, that's the uh, first section of the uh, of the uh, column, uh, of section 242 of the column of table one would would be amended to $100,000. Uh, the uh, in relation to that, and that's it. Uh, uh, I would uh, actually uh, move an amendment uh, in relation to that, which I've just referred to then on page 24, so that uh, the uh, table one, column one power, and, and the first uh, section under section 242, that they're all section 242s, that the, where the expenditure is in excess of, delete $50,000 and put in $100,000. And under that, uh, where the expenditure does not exceed $50,000, make that $100,000 as well. Seconded. Right, I just think, Councillor Cumming, I just need you to, to um, repeat that for everybody, please. So you're moving an amendment motion that's yeah. been seconded by Councillor Cassidy, and it's in regards to, it's on uh, an, an amendment on item page 24. Yes, the page two 24 items. of the ENC report, where there's, re there's reference to $50,000 uh, at the, uh, the First two boxes on that column. Yep. Table one. Yep. Make each in each case make it a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Um, yep. Uh, yeah. All right. I might understand it to be supported. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I was going to say I was going to invite you to speak. To oh the yeah. Amendment. Well, sorry. Uh, yes. I'm. I'm. I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> Look. Uh, yeah, look, as I said, I just explained with, with my speech generally that $100,000 was uh, it's being used for all the other uh, expenditure levels and it should be used for parks as well. And uh, as I said, $100,000 is reasonable and uh, uh, not an excessive amount for uh, any expenditure of uh, park, funds on park improvements. Further speakers to the amendment? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I've got some issues with respect to the uh, amendment before us today. I have no problem with consistency in the levels of expenditure, and I've got no idea why the Lord Mayor has no confidence in Councillor Fiona Hammond to reduce the amount of expenditure that she is allowed to authorise through the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee. Perhaps he can put on the record um, why that committee, of which I am a member, um, does not have the same level of authorisation to approve contracts as other committees. That doesn't seem uh, fair or correct to me. Uh, secondly, um, I don't know if it's another typo in the council papers today, um, but if the Public and Active Transport Economic Tourism Development Committee, the Public uh, and what's the other one that's on there? Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee can authorise $100,000 of expenditure. Why can't the Environments, Parks and Sustainability Committee? Now, Councillor Hammond, I know that question must be on your Sorry. lips. I'm happy to put it into the public sphere and ask the Lord Mayor. Um, I presume it's a typo, um, and for consistency, I think they should all be the same. Um, all right. Uh, do I have any speakers against? Right, further speakers in general? 
Councillor Tree. Just really quickly to thank both sides of the chamber for a common sense amendment, which I think will speed up the process of approving projects and um, acknowledges that councillors can use common sense when making decisions about local projects in their area. Further speakers? Uh, yeah, Lord just Mayor. briefly. Uh, yeah, we're more than happy to support these changes. Um, and we are ha happy to support them being uh, the same across the board. Um, simply, uh, you know, th these were the uh, limits that we were going in with from the previous arrangements. That's why they are in the papers. But uh, you know, there are some good reasons to reconsider. And, and given we've got uh, across the board support, why not? Further speakers? Councillor Cumming, write a reply. All right. All those in favour of the amendment to adjust the figure on page 24, the two figures from 50,000 to 100,000, all in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. We'll now return to the substantial uh, papers before us. Are there any uh, further speakers? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. Uh, speak on item C, the major amendment to the plan package E. Point of order. Point of order, um, Councillor Johnston. Councillor Mackay's microphone's not on. Uh, Councillor Mackay, please adjust that. Thank, Thank you. you. That's very kind. Um, I rise to speak to item C, major amendment to city plan package E, specifically the incentivisation of car sharing. And I just want to explain why car sharing is so important. It is a model of car rental where people rent cars for short periods, often by the hour. And this mode of transport mainly appeals to customers who only need to make occasional use of a vehicle such as inner city residents, tourists and university students, as well as others who would like occasional access to a vehicle of a different type other than day-to-day -day use. And this is a great example, Chair, of this administration planning for the future, because in a blink of an eye, we're likely to get self-driving cars. But for now, let's talk about what we do have. We have, in the short term, keyless cars rented in hourly increments with round-the-clock access with no staffing requirement. And why is that important? Well, let's explain the, uh, the concept of just enough car. Now, this means that vehicle sharing services help give access to just enough car, and they help to reduce car ownership and the pressure on parking spaces, Chair, and that's good for household budgets and good for Brisbane. If you can mostly get around by foot, bike and public transport, you might not choose to buy a car. But what happens when you would like to go to, let's say, Ikea or go on a picnic and you need access to a car? Well, that's why we've seen the rise of car, chair, a car sharing chair, cars you can hire near your home or at your home. Perfect for those who don't need a whole car, just enough car. Car sharing services give people the flexibility so they can sell their car or decide not to buy one or two. In turn, it frees up parking spaces. And what does that do? That helps congestion. The Brisbane Parking Task Force recognised the growing popularity of car share schemes around the world, with membership expected to grow to 12 million by 2020. A change has been made to the car share definition in the Transport Access Parking and Servicing Planning Scheme policy to make it clear that car share spaces are to be for the exclusive use of residents in multiple dwelling and rooming accommodation developments. Why did this development uh, amendment come about and why is it so important? Well, vehicle car sharing, vehicle sharing or car sharing has been shown to reduce household vehicle ownership rates. International experience, Chair, says that 17 per cent of car share members sold their cars because they were no longer needed. And if they don't go entirely carless, they often sell their second car, which is often much less used. And that means parking demand was decreased because there were fewer cars in each residence. And vehicle miles travelled were reduced by staggeringly 29,000 kilometres a year, according to a master's thesis from UCLA. I'm not sure how reliable that is, but it's the best I could find. Accordingly, greenhouse gas emissions were reduced because, generally speaking, car share drivers do fewer kilometres. Now, car share companies will tell us that there are challenges, and that includes vandalising of on-street vehicles and dedicated car spaces. And this amendment, Chair, helps both of those challenges. 
Recommendation 14 of the Brisbane Parking Task Force Citywide On Street Parking Review Report and Recommendations propose that Council actively incentivise the expansion of car sharing schemes in Brisbane within new developments. Chair, there's a car, scare, car share scheme getting it all mixed up there, Chair, I apologise, in my area and I am a member. It is a very handy short-term uh, short solution when you need a car. But let's talk about the benefits for new developments. The benefit for multiple dwellings and rooming accommodation in the core area of Brisbane is the car share spaces are not included in the maximum, so they are not limited in providing car share spaces. And the benefit for multiple dwellings and rooming accommodation in the non-core area of Brisbane is the car share spaces are included in the minimum. So car share spaces can be included in the spaces that they need to provide. Now, the intent of the proposed car share amendments is for the body corporate to retain control of car share spaces in multiple dwelling or rooming accommodation developments. However, this will not limit or restrict a body corporate's ability to engage a third party to manage the daily operation and maintenance of a car share vehicle or fleet. So to sum up, the major benefit of car share is that it provides value for money alternative to car ownership for residents who need a car infrequently. By reducing car ownership, this provides benefits to the community. These benefits include decreased congestion, reduced emissions, less urban space required for parking, increased use of public and active transport options, and less congestion on our roads. Chair, Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner and his administration is committed to building the infrastructure we need and protecting our lifestyle. So get on board. I urge uh, councillors like Councillor Shree, who love this kind of thing, to get on board. And this amendment will assist in reducing congestion, increase transport type sharing, reduce on-street parking pressure, and prepare Brisbane for a new tomorrow. Further speakers? Anyone at all? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on... Um I'll say all of them. I don't think I'll get to all of them today. Um, but I would like to start with item F, the Suburban Enhancement Fund Policy and Associated Delegations. Um, I, I note the Lord Mayor didn't answer uh, my rhetorical question earlier about why um, the Parks Committee got less. And I hope he, well, he actually can't sum up, so I guess I'll just speculate. Um, I'm glad that the amendment has been agreed by all parties, um, but I would just say that next time we have to make sure that there is fairness across the committees in how they operate and how they work. Um, no committee should be getting more delegated powers than another committee on the same issue. And I just draw the Lord Mayor's attention to that so it doesn't happen again in the future. Now, with respect to this, uh, this fund, um, I have real concerns about how it is going to operate in practice. What we know now um, is that there used to be a Ward Parks Trust Fund. Um, those funds uh, are infrastructure charges from developments in your local area. A percentage of those were put into your Ward Parks Trust Fund uh, so that where development was happening, um, those areas got funds to reinvest back into the community. Now, Campbell Newman stopped that uh, back in 2009, and those funds now go into uh, the uh, consolidated revenue, so to speak, of council. So they go into the big budget, they wash around, and they overwhelmingly end up in LNP areas. So we're not seeing the outcome of the infrastructure charges invested in particular areas associated with major development being invested back in those areas in a similar way. So then um, uh, there was a different fund set up called the Ward Parks and Footpaths uh, Trust Fund. Um, that trust fund started off with a certain amount of money in it, um, uh, and it has to be used now for parks and footpaths. Now the problem with that is that some councillors are more equal than other councillors because yes, and the Lord Mayor does this, and when I tell my residents about it, they're shocked after they get his letter saying, oh, each councillor gets exactly the same amount. And then I write out to them and, and give them the pages out of the budget where all the LNP wards get huge capital spends for their parks and footpaths. My residents are very surprised. So the problem that we have uh, with the way in which council funds are allocated, which has always been the problem, is 
Yes, all councillors get the same amount in the Parks Trust Fund, or as now called the Suburban Enhancement Fund. However, this LNP pork barrels in its own wards using capital spend uh, from, the, uh, from the budget uh, to invest in their own areas at the expense of others. My ward is one of those where we are neglected year after year uh, by this administration. Now, this year we actually have two parks projects. First time in, I think, 2010 was the last time I had a parks project allocated in the budget, and I'm not including Ken Fletcher uh, because that was a different deal. That was an off-market deal done between the developer and council. But in 2010, I got $100,000 for a small playground upgrade at Corinda. Um, this year in the budget, that's 2019-20 for those playing along, we got $108,000 in the budget uh, for point of order. Mr. Point of Chair, order, uh, Deputy just Mayor. the relevance to the enhancement fund. This is about yep. the budget. Yeah, please, um, Councillor yep. Johnston, um, ensure that your comments are relevant to the matter at hand. Item yes. F. And I'm elaborating on my point that these funds are not being distributed fairly, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to make the point that there is a problem uh, with the way in which. Point of order. Point of order, Lord Mayor. She's, re she's making a point different to this. These funds are being allocated fairly, equally amongst all councils. That, that's, that's right. So the funds are uniform across all council wards. Um, I have allowed a, a fair deal of latitude. Um, Councillor Johnston, please um, take a moment to, to conclude the point you're making and, and, uh, and make the point you wish to and uh, my in point, a timely manner. Thank you. And my point is, Mr Chairman, that this year I have got a little bit of money uh, from the capital budget, but for the past 10 years I have not. I've had to make do with the annual allocation, the minimum amount that every councillor gets, and then most other councillors get hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some councillors get millions of dollars on top of that. That is not a fair way to run the city. Um, and the Lord Mayor, and we heard Councillor uh, Cummings mention this as well, the Lord Mayor tries to bamboozle residents when he writes out to them and says they all get the same amount of money. That's fundamentally untrue. So my concern with the way in which this has been set up is, again, councillors are going to have to do much more with less. We're now going to be expected to fund a whole range of projects under this funding with less money. Um, we're not going to get extra money in the capital. We're not going to get extra money uh, to deliver these projects. Uh, we have to fund more projects and uh, different types of projects out of this suburban enhancement fund. Now, the problem with that is, and this is a real problem um, that my officers are telling me about, so it must be the same for everyone. Um, for example, council is taking 25 per cent of our funds as overheads. Now, that is how much, when the Lord Mayor stood up here and said there was $560,000 available for councillors to use in their wards, that is fundamentally untrue. $140,000 of this is corporate overhead. It is absolutely cut from our budgets. It is not available for us to spend, um, and it is a huge problem. And Councillor um, Hammond, shake your head all you want. My officers, I've questioned them. They've given me an example. $108,000. We only have $83,000 to spend on the actual parks project. So there is a real problem in the way the funds are being administered, number one. Um, why is it that council whose salaries are being funded, council officers whose salaries are being funded under core revenue, are also um, uh, recouping costs back through this fund, which is for the purpose of expenditure on parks, playgrounds, and now every other thing under the sun that you want to jam into this fund? So that is a real problem. Two, um, now we're going to have more areas where this Lord Mayor is going to stand up and tell residents that all councillors get the same. It's not true. Um, then the Lord Mayor goes and pork barrels in all these other areas in the budget. That is an unfair way of running how the city uh, allocates funds. So um, when Councillor uh, Adams wrote to us about this uh, a few months ago, I thought maybe, yes, there'll be a policy that comes out for draft uh, for us to review and that all councillors might get a say in what the new policy might be, that perhaps this is the new consultative Lord Mayor who wants to engage with us uh, in a positive way. No. Um, we get, what, 
uh, three lines in an uh, ENC report where we're being told what the outcome is. That's how this LNP administration run this city. Um, we were asked for our ideas and feedback. We haven't had a response. I don't know if any other councillor got a response from Councillor Adams, but we didn't get a response. We weren't given a draft policy to review and discuss to make sure it would work for all councillors. Um, we're being told the outcome here today at ENC. So my concerns are as follows. One, this administration is not effectively spending this money. Too much is going into corporate overheads that is unaccountable and not being invested wisely for the purpose of uh, footpaths, park and other improvements in our city. Two, this Lord Mayor pork barrels in LNP wards and provides additional funding to some councillors well in excess of the minimum that all councillors get, and that is an unfair way to run the administration of funding in this city. And three, um, the way in which that this process has been undertaken uh, without proper consultation with residents I don't think has been reasonable, given um, this is a fund that all of us use, all of us have to deal with residents on, and we would have got a better outcome about this if we were engaged and we engaged in a proper consultative process. And that has not happened, but that is just the way this council rolls. Now, very briefly, with respect to some of the other items uh, on the agenda, um, I am extremely concerned about the reduction of uh, the uh, amount of funding for the scooter program in uh, item uh, D before us. Uh, item E, I'm sorry, in the contracts and tendering report, it's an eye-watering figure. Um, there's no reason for it to be hidden. Uh, I don't understand why a figure like that is commercial in confidence. Um, it's a significant issue. Um, I don't even know that we're allowed to say it's quite an unusual description of the funds. Um, I don't know if in some way we've perhaps taken an investment stake in these businesses, um, but I'm extremely concerned um, about the way this is described and the fact that the total amount of money has been redacted and is not uh, available for public consultation and discussion uh, and debate in this place. Um, uh, I also am concerned about uh, the, ferry, uh, uh, the ferry project, uh, the procurement project that we've been put forward before us today. Um, again, <laughs> we're redacting um, almost all of the criteria except one. So if all the criteria are commercial in confidence, why is one not? So this is what I don't understand. There are one, two, three, four, five, six uh, weighted evaluation criteria. Five of those. Uh, Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. Uh, further speakers, Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I rise to talk to item E and in particular um, item two of attachment A, our smoother suburban streets, external asphalt resurfacing construction package five. Um, Chair, as you know, this administration is committed to getting residents home quicker and safer. And this contract was awarded to Fulton Hogan to deliver resurfacing works as part of this administration's historic $360 million Smoother Suburban Streets program. This is the largest resurfacing investment in the history of this city. And I would like to thank our officers for their incredible hard work in delivering this historic investment, not only on time, but ahead of schedule. I'm pleased to report that we have already delivered over 1,700 streets far ahead of our schedule. We have in Brisbane an incredible team of dedicated officers who are delivering for the residents of Brisbane, as I said, far ahead of schedule. And that is why budget was brought forward in previous years to keep up with the pace of our hardworking officers. So the $360 million commitment remains, and this year's budget means that over the course of this term, we have invested $360 million in delivering 2,000 newly resurfaced streets for the residents of Brisbane. Shame on those opposite who try to disparage the work of our hardworking officers, and could I once again put on record my thanks to the incredibly hardworking um, team out there that uh, is ensuring that we get home quicker and safer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Any further debate? Hmm. Councillor Shree. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak really briefly on item E and item F. Um, just also on the e-scooter contract figure, I'm not even sure, I guess the journalists don't get access to this either, but um, it's a very low figure. I'll, I'll say that much. I, I, I think the amount of money that councils get in um, for those e-scooters is way too low. Um, I, and hang on, we're not paying them, right? Just to clarify, they're, no, no, they're, they're paying us. Even so, um, the, fi the figure is way, way, I, I know I was freaking out for a second there, but e even so, the, the figure is way too low. Um, you consider the amount, of, um, the amount of value that these companies are extracting from um, being able to operate in the city, the fact that they've got exclusive, essentially two monopoly or duopoly over the city, um, that's, that's worth a heck of a lot of money. Um, and these companies will be monetizing their presence in the city through a range of mechanisms above and beyond the core service of um, delivering the e-scooters themselves. They'll be able to monetize the data that's collected from the e-scooter services. They'll be able to monetize the, um, the trip data, but also the contact data. Um, and so they're gonna make not, not just millions, but tens of millions of dollars out of using our city's footpaths and, and pathways. And yet the figure that they are contributing back towards um, council revenue via this permit uh, is very, very low. And I think the residents of Brisbane are being grossly shortchanged. I'm um, really surprised that we didn't negotiate more assertively and get more money out of these companies. And I'm particularly frustrated because these companies are gonna benefit a lot from the infrastructure that council is building in terms of bike lanes and footpath upgrades. So council spends millions and millions of dollars on bikeway projects and footpath projects. And these scooters, these scooter companies get the benefit of those projects that um, to a far greater degree than ordinary residents. Yes, all, be all residents are gonna benefit from footpath and, and bike lane upgrades, but these scooter companies get a significantly larger overall benefit. Um, yet they, they, are contributing, they are contributing very, very little towards the cost of that infrastructure that they'll be using. And I think this is a really, really significant concern for me because we're going to see more and more of these e-scooters. We're going to see more and more use of these e-scooters on our roads and, and paths, and they're going to have a more significant impact on our footpaths and bike lanes. So it stands to reason that those companies should be contributing their fair share towards widening of footpaths or towards upgrading footpaths or towards introducing new bike lanes. If a company is making money from council infrastructure, it should be contributing back towards the cost of that infrastructure. And based on the figure that's been delivered, that's been produced here in the commercial and confidence paper, um, documents, I have no confidence that that's what's going on here. Um, just turning really briefly to item F, I, I assume the, the mayor's not gonna be able to wrap up, is that correct? Because, because no, he's speaking to the amended amendment, so I, I don't think he'll be able to wrap up, but I'll, hopefully Councillor Adams as deputy mayor will be able to respond to this. Um, I just wanted to clarify, um, I'm obviously quite pleased that the policy regarding the Suburban Enhancement Fund has been amended and I'm, I'm grateful that the administration's been listening to councillors and the concerns we've been raising about that. I just wanted to clarify and I hope, hope the Deputy Mayor will be able to respond to this directly. Um, the policy refers to being able to um, spend money on active transport um, improvements and, and on projects within the road reserve. So does that mean that this money could potentially be used for bike lanes? And does that might mean the money could potentially be used for zebra crossings? Um, so I just wanted to get a very clear answer from that. Um, and if that is the case, um, where there's a situation where, for example, the, the transport team feels that a particular project is not a high priority, but the local councillor feels that it is a priority, if the local council wants to spend the money on it, then presumably they should be able to do so unless there's some strong engineering reason not to do so. So hopefully the deputy mayor will just be able to clarify and confirm that and I'd, I'd be very grateful for that. Um, probably won't surprise anyone to learn that I have strong concerns about um, some of the city plan amendments and, and the items in not the listed in item C and D, et cetera. But, um, and in general, obviously very concerned about the outsourcing of the ferry contracts towards to private companies. I think that's something that'd be better off if we tried to do in-house and just those companies, would, those, um, those ferry operators were directly employed by council. We own the vessels, we own the whole service. Therefore, we, have, we would have a lot more direct control and accountability. So I certainly don't support outsourcing of that core council business. 
Thank you, Councillor Shree. Further po debate? Point of order, sorry. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. I'm sorry, I just forgot to do this in my debate. I'd like item C taken seriatim for debating purposes, and I'd like... Uh, Oh, sorry, for voting purposes, I apologise. And I'd like uh, item eight in E taken seriatim for voting purposes. Sorry, Councillor Johnson, it's item C for voting purposes only. Oh, sorry, that's right. Item E. Item E? Yes. Uh, no, contract eight. I'd like taken seriatim, please. Thank you. He said C. Okay. Councillor Burke. Um, thanks very much, uh, Mr Chair. I just rise to uh, talk on uh, item C, D, and um, I'm just going to touch on item F very, very quickly, and I'll leave the substantive debate to Councillor Hammond. But this creative reinventing of um, uh, planning history in the city of Brisbane by councillors. So um, the Integrated Planning Act had provisions. That's a state government planning document. Uh, the Integrated Planning Act had provisions about how infrastructures were collect infrastructure charges were collected and distributed. And they set up this mechanism, the state government, not council, the state government through their planning act set up this mechanism where uh, a component of the charges collected for an individual development would be put aside for park purposes inside that local uh, area of the, the council area. Uh, that was then changed by the Bly government when they brought in the Sustainable Planning Act. Uh, it wasn't this thing, apparently, that Campbell Newman did. Uh, it was a change by the state government to the State Planning Act, not a change by Brisbane City Council uh, to the planning scheme. And, and of course, again, even since uh, the Sustainable moment, Planning Act, all three of these planning acts. Uh, uh, I remind councillors that we will hear the debate uh, in silence, please. Thank you. Thank you. Continue, Councillor Burke. And as I was saying, Mr. Uh, Acting Chair, uh, and even since the Integrated Planning Act and then the Sustainable Planning Act, we now also have the Planning Act, which is the third Planning Act uh, that has been in place since I've been a councillor in this place, Mr. Chairman. So uh, you just need to be very careful with some of that history uh, and understand who actually did the changes uh, rather than listening to some of the verbose debate that comes from people in this place. Uh, just turning to uh, item C, which is a major amendment, Mr Chairman, uh, and this has been to the council chamber before. Uh, I was interested in Councillor Shree's comments, uh, where he said that he's got a lot of concerns uh, with um, uh, some of the parts of this particular uh, document. Uh, I'm just wondering, Mr Chairman, whether it's the updating to the dwelling house character overlay, uh, the update to the significant landscape tree overlay, the updates to the traditional building character overlay, the transport air quality corridor overlay, the waterways corridor, corridor overlay uh, might be the general waterway corridor overlay where we're encouraging better design outcomes and protecting riparian vegetation that he has a problem with. It might be uh, the uh, protections that we're putting in place through this planning amendment for the Trifford, a live music venue in the city, Mr Chairman, that he has a problem with. It might be the uh, changes in the policy position inside the planning scheme to strengthen and clarify some of the existing provisions around multiple unit dwellings that he has a problem with, Mr Chairman. It might be uh, the way that we're also making sure that the structural integrity of the Clem Jones and the Legacy Way tunnels are being considered as part of developments that are being uh, done near those two uh, major pieces of transport infrastructure that he has a challenge with, uh, Mr Chairman. Or it may be the clearer direction that we're providing and improvements to the framework uh, for industrial zone precincts across the city that he has a problem with. Or it may be the real kicker, Mr Chairman. Maybe Councillor Shree has a problem with the car share provisions that are in this document before he has. Because all of those things, which is what is in this item before us, are all very good, very sound changes to the city plan uh, that we have gone out to public consultation for. We had 30-odd submissions, 36 uh, properly made submissions, uh, Mr Chairman, when we went out between the 5th of March and the 12th of April. Um, we've taken on board the feedback. There is a lot of important things that we are doing as part of this major amendment package, Mr Chairman. Uh, we are providing the protection to the Trifford as a live, menu, live music venue in our city, similar to the provisions that, are, that protect other parts of the valley, Mr Chairman. Uh, that is a good outcome. That means that the live music scene is having, being helped, being supported in our city, Mr Chairman. And I would have thought people on both sides of the chamber would have been supporting those particular provisions. When it comes to car share, 
I would have thought this would also have a bipartisan support, Mr Chairman, because this is the way of the future. This is facilitating and supporting uh, less car usage in the city and making sure that we have provisions that meet the expectations of the community. It was a clear piece of feedback out of Brisbane's Future Blueprint. Residents of this city, where they were engaged, and we know the Labor Party didn't like us going out and actually having a real conversation with people about planning in this city, where we went out and we asked people for their views. We asked for their feedback. We asked for their ideas, 15,000 of them, Mr Chairman. And we've been, and well, that, and see again, so Councillor Cumming can't help himself, Mr. Chairman. He just goes, video games, that's all, video games, that's all Councillor Cumming thought Plan Your Brisbane was about. So this is the stark contrast real engagement, listening to the residents of Brisbane on this side of the chamber, and flippant, sarcastic comments from the Labor Party when it comes to development and engaging with residents on the other side of the chamber. And the stark choice can't be more so, Mr. Chairman, for the people of Brisbane going forward. So things like car share schemes, things like rooftop gardens, things like delivering more parks, delivering more to see and do across the city is what this administration is getting on with and delivering, getting you home safer and quicker. We're getting on and actually actioning the items that the residents of Brisbane wanted us to do. And again, through the provisions that we'll be installing into city plan, we facilitate the outcomes to support car share schemes. There's a number of these that already operate in the city, Mr Chairman, and we need to make sure that they're complying with our city plan. And our city plan actually incentivises them. Our city plan actually supports them. Because in a city residence, unlike when the Labor Party did their socialist template of town planning in this city through the 1990s and jammed residents into part of the inner city, provided no transport options, but expected them to have no car parking, we think that people should have a choice. And so you might not need two cars, Mr Chairman, you might only need one car, but you, if you do need a second vehicle, you need to have a framework that supports that. And a car share scheme being run by the body corporate or being run by a, a private company on behalf of the body corporate in buildings around the city helps, supports and facilitates that. It requires less car parking, it requires less demand on our roads and infrastructure, Mr Chairman, but it provides choice and option for people wanting to live in our city. And that's what this administration is about, Mr Chairman, making sure that the people who want to live in our city and the people who do have the options and the choice for the lifestyle that they want to live in this great city of Brisbane. And I encourage all councillors to support item C, Major Amendment E, to the city plan for all of the good things that are in it. And I don't know what Councillor Shree was going on about when he said he couldn't support it because it means he doesn't support car share schemes and he doesn't support all of the other items that I listed out at the start of my speech. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Street. Claim to be misrepresented. Thank you. Further debate? I think I speak on the misrepresentation now, don't I? Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said, Councillor Street. I said I claim to be misrepresented, so then I, you should be I invited me to speak to the misrepresentation. I'll, I'll invite you to and speak to the misrepresentation at this time, if you wish. Yeah, sure. That's how, that's how the rules work. Yeah. Um, so. Just, just in response to Councillor Burke's comments, um, he suggested I wasn't supportive of car share. Obviously, I am. My concerns with the city plan amendment process are much more detailed and nuanced than that, and I won't go into that detail now. Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Um, I'd like to move that council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. Uh, Councillor Richards has moved that we adjourn for afternoon tea, seconded by Councillor Marks. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Watch out, sandwiches.
Further debate? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, I rise to speak uh, on item B, the uh, deed of variation to the Westpac Master Lease Rental Facility Agreement. As a result of accounting standard changes, our leased assets are required to be reflected in our assets on the Council's balance sheet. As we have seen in the financial statements and budget, this has also resulted in an increase in Council's liabilities. Operating leases, as reflected in this agreement, are beneficial to Council as it reduces risk to Council. For example, if technology changes and uh, different types of vehicles are preferred by the, the community, or alternatively, if there were potentially changes to uh, our TransLink contract. Under the current agreement, the operating leases, Council does not have to bear ownership of the vehicles and uh, obviously that provides Council with a great mechanism to manage risk, but also it provides us with uh, as much flexibility as we could reasonably accept or expect under this type of arrangement. Under the Westpac lease agreement, Council is provided with new buses for a total period of 18 years. And basically, it's an eight plus five plus five arrangement. The change to the operating lease with Westpac is to remove the buyback provision. And the rationale for this is that this variation will ensure that all our leased buses are accounted for in the same way under the new lease accounting standards. Now, Council still has the right to purchase back the buses at the end of the term, but typically they are released at the end of the operating agreement. Council's bus fleet consists of more than 1,200 buses, and the Lord Mayor touched upon this a bit earlier. And of those 1,200 buses, 754 are leased through Westpac, and the remaining 305 are leased through CBA. With more than 79 million passengers on buses in Brisbane each year, it is important we have a modern and reliable bus fleet, and obviously our community benefits significantly from this particular fleet. In order to keep the bus fleet modern, this administration committed in 2016 to deliver 60 new buses each year. All are equipped with low floors, air conditioning and CCTV monitors. Our bus fleet is now 100% air conditioned and wheelchair accessible, providing easy access for all passengers. In the last financial year, Council also replaced 55 retired buses with new vehicles that meet the enhanced environmentally friendly vehicle standards. And as the Lord Mayor mentioned, Council will be entering a new bus lease agreement from the 1st of July 2020. So at this point in time, we're in a, a transitionary period, but certainly this is a very important agreement for us and the uh, proposed variation will ensure that we can continue to operate and acquire buses as necessary. Thank you. Further debate? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Chair. I rise to speak on item A, E and F and answer a few of the questions that have been brought up today. First of all, with item A, it's around the significant contracting plan for ferry, ferry infrastructure operations and maintenance. Let us start, first of all, by making it clear this is not a contract. This is not the contract. This is the contracting plan that actually is the process to source a provider to operate our ferry services. As we've heard from other councillors today, Transdev does currently run the service and they have done so since 2010, but there are no further options to extend this beyond November next year. We know that our city cat and our city hopper services remain highly popular, um, very fun way to get around the city as well as a popular way out of 5 million trips a year. So it is quite a significant contract for Council and it's very important to the functioning of the city as well. We have a total of 30 vessels, 25 ferry terminals, which all fit under the remit of this contract. And the successful provider will absolutely need to ensure that these assets are maintained to a high level, which includes the cleaning of the terminals as well as the boats as well. Market research shows that the contract terms are usually around that seven to 15 years mark, and that's what we'll be looking at for this contract as well. 
we are opting for the five plus five plus five in this one as well. But Councillor Cumming asked, I hope to make sure they look after the infrastructure. Well, obviously, as it is there clearly in the contract plan, condition ordinance, management, maintenance are all in there. Disappointed to hear Councillor Cumming say outright that uh, he doesn't think Transdev should get it again. Um, we will need to let the stall board go through the procedure and the process that we have here before us. But I think it's interesting to note, if you currently look on TransLink's user surveys about customer service, the most popular customer service for public transport across trains, buses and ferries are our city cats and ferries. The, definitely the most popular customer service. So these tenders are going to be open until the close of business of the 20th of November. I hope we get a great outcome and some uh, great competition there as well. With regards to item E, there were some comments around not getting enough money um, from the, uh, the successful applicants for our scooters. Scooters are very new in Brisbane City. Obviously, we, do ha we have produced a lot of infrastructure around pedestrian and bikeways that scooters are going to be able to access as well. They haven't even been here in Brisbane for a year. And I think it's important to note for this contract as well, particularly when Councillor Shri says we're not bleeding them for every cent they have, but you know, that's how the Greens run business. Um, they don't really think about the economic viability of things. It's just about getting as much money as they can and burning it as fast as they can. Um, this contract is only for one year. It's only a one-year contract, and of course, then it will come up for a review, renewal. Let's have a look at exactly how it's gone. And I think the biggest thing we need to talk about is safety, and that's why the two tenderers that were successful in this round was based on safety and what they offered for the pedestrians and the other people around Brisbane. Many, many aspects of that that I've spoken to ad nauseum in this chamber. But of course, the financials will come in when we review that in 12 months' time as well. And then, of course, the most interesting debate around item F this afternoon on the Suburban Enhancement Fund. We have heard nothing from Councillor Johnson and some of the ALP councillors over the last year except, let us do more, let us do more. Can we do more? Can we do more with our Ward Parks Trust Fund? Can we do more? Well, here we are today with a policy that actually allows you to do more. And now we hear nothing but whinging again. The, the absolute falsehoods we heard from Councillor Johnson around this would mean less capital across the city is blatantly untrue. Every councillor gets $562,000 to spend across their wards. Corporate overheads have always been an aspect of this, last year, the year before, and so on, and so forth, and so on. This fund is not replacing the Ward Parks Trust Fund, is it expanding? And the title is changed to represent that expansion. If you do not want to spend it on anything else other than footpaths or parks, that is your decision, local councillor. You can continue to only spend it on local footpaths and parks, because as the Lord Mayor explained, it used to be just footpaths. And then we expanded it to parks when, as we have heard the true change around the infrastructure charges, it became apparent that we were losing the ability for councillors to have that priority within their wards where they thought it was important. So again, the LNP administration expanded the size of this fund. And still, Oliver is sitting over there in the Tennyson ward saying, more, more, more. <laughs> It's not how you run a budget. It's not how you run a city. Point of order. Uh, I think the uh, the Lord Mayor, uh, the uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, should be referring to councillors by their titles and not call, not giving them nicknames like Oliver or whoever that was. Uh, Councillor, come in. Can you please wait for the call next time when you make a point of order? I noted that, Deputy Mayor. Sorry, I wasn't speaking uh, terribly about any particular in, in, in general, any councillor in general, but councillors on that side have stood and spoke today saying they want more, they wanted better, it should be more. We're not getting enough. It was a general. So that's why I just did a general comment of Oliver Twist. Um, but I did ask every councillor for their feedback on this, 
And not every councillor got back to me because that's fine. I understand that some councillors are very happy that they are, and some councillors actually trust the administration to make governance decisions in the best um, interest of the community. And we have heard very clearly on this side about what the more is that they want. But what I got in my emails to me and what I hear today seem to be two very, very different things. I will thank Councillor Cumming for his feedback. I did hear today from Councillor Cumming that we shouldn't be doing this in some areas because it's taking over capital works, which is not right. But Councillor Cumming, I'd like to tick off, tick off what you came to me in your consultation and said, I'd, dear Krista, playground equipment, public artwork, lights for sporting clubs who lease commercial land. Tick, tick and tick, Councillor Cumming. I think you got everything that you requested. The councillor for Tennyson. Do you mean a wider range of projects and parks and footpaths? Oh, yes, I do. Is that new infrastructure, for example, zebra crossings or refuge under the fund we can get done? Yes, I do, because that would be great as council has refused blah, 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 blah. But that would be great. Guess what, councillor Johnson? Tick, tick and tick. And to councillor Shree's answer, yes, absolutely. It is there very clear in the application of funds 1.1. Physical works, physical, okay, infrastructure works, improvements, parks, active transport infrastructure, assets within the road reserve or community facility infrastructure on council managed land. And then we still have that ability that if it's one of your sporting clubs and it crosses boundaries, you can talk to your local councillors next door and see if you can share the cost or pay for it even if it's there in their wards. But this is about expanding and enhancing the opportunities for our communities with a councillor priority. And again, to Councillor Shree's answer, it is about councillors being able to prioritise their half a million dollars to what they think is important in their ward. But please take note particularly when you look at some of the finer details in the policy, that obviously it does not, as you mentioned, override engineering around, um, particularly in road reserve. Uh, my experience over the last 10 years, particularly when we're talking about zebra crossings, that we don't do zebra crossings um, anymore because cars don't stop. So it's one I'm hesitant to say, yes, you can do zebra crossings, but pedestrian refuges, places where you're breaking up the uh, the cross across the road, but pedestrian crossing points, T-splitters. Again, it's only half a million dollars. Some of that will be more than that, but that is now the councillor's decision if that is their priority over, maybe they're getting to the point where their parks have all been done. Or in my case, some people just don't want footpaths and you're looking for other opportunities to enhance that. So this is enhancing our Ward Parks Trust Fund with a new Suburban Enhancement Fund policy, and I am very proud to support it to the Chambers. Further speakers? Anyone at all? There being none? Uh, the Lord Mayor is not uh, here at the moment, so we will... Oh, right, of course. All right, so now we will put items A, B, D and F all those in favour of items A, B, D and F say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. On item C, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called. Council Division. Coming in, Councillor Strunk. Ayes to my right, noes to my left. Uh, please ring the bells.
Attendance, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour, one against and three abstentions. Please return to your seats. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. Councillors, in regards to item E, all those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we will now move to the ENC Special Report. Lord Mayor, the ENC Special of the 3rd of September. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, right. I move that the uh, report of the Special Meeting of Establishment and Coordination Committee held on Tuesday, 3rd of September 2019 be adopted. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that a report of the Special Meeting the Establishment Coordination Committee meeting held on 3rd of September 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Lord Mayor. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, the, item, uh, the single item on the agenda for this special report is the Queensland Audit Office final management letter. Uh, this follows up the um, auditing of Council's financial statements, which was done by the Auditor General and his department, um, and this is something that happens each year. Uh, once again, the Auditor General has issued an unmodified opinion, consistent with the last couple of years, uh, and that, I mean, unmodified opinion um, may not sound very impressive, but it is a really uh, important achievement for Council um, and something that uh, not all organisations manage to receive from the Audit Office. Um, and so, uh, once again, we've had uh, our financial statements independently audited by a state government entity, um, and they have uh, given us um, some issues to focus on, which we uh, continue to do, um, and all of those issues that have been raised with us are being acted on, um, as is quite clearly stated uh, here in the report. Uh, we will continue to work with the Audit Office um, going forward. But overall, um, Council's uh, management of the budget and management of the financials uh, is in a very strong position and will continue to be so going forward while we continue to focus on responsible financial management and making sure that we cut the cloth to measure when it comes to how we deliver projects um, and uh, allocating priority funding across the city and also how we deal with um, the management of uh, financial transactions and also our many systems that we operate in council. Um, one of the key issues in the uh, Queensland Audit Office assessment or that, that they commented on is our infrastructure assets recorded on our balance sheet reflecting the current replacement costs. Um, that can vary from the book value due to a range of market factors. Uh, the report the report reflected that this is an issue across different areas such as community facilities. Um, another related issue was when council replaces part of an asset where our internal uh, process is triggered to recognise that as a disposal. Um, other matters outlined include our infrastructure register recording notices that are no longer outstanding, SAP segregation of duties uh, implementation at the time in which Council capitalises a project after it finishes. Obviously, these, these issues are uh, of interest to the Audit Office and interest to Council's financial staff, um, but they are not issues that I expect would be of major interest to the community. Um, they are uh, consistent with um, an appropriate assessment of, of how we um, carry out our financial activities. And as I said, the important thing here is that these minor issues that were raised um, are being acted on, have been acted on, and we will continue to act on any issues brought to our attention by the Queensland Audit Office. Uh, so we will continue that positive working relationship going forward, and I look forward to um, having councillors' support of this particular submission. 
Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. For a long time, if, if ever, in, I've been a councillor for a fair while now, and uh, I uh, just refer to uh, the issues raised, infrastructure charges registered, not updated, risk rating medium, uh, work in progress on a due date, May 2020, uh, disposals not recorded for some partial infrastructure asset uh, replacement, risk rate medium, work in progress, March 2020. Uh, comprehensive valuations were not completed for some buildings and sports complexes in align with council accounting policy. So the audit office is saying council hasn't even complied with its own policy. Rating deficiency, work in progress, April 2020. This is probably the next one, SAP. Segregation of duties and review of access privileges, rating deficiency. As, uh, and it's stated here, as reported in their interim report, QAO and VCC Assurance Service identify deficiencies in relation to incompatible SAP system access and segregation of duties, uh, compensating controls not identified for all conflicting roles, compensating controls that had been identified had not been tested for operational effectiveness. And the implications were there's an increased risk of unauthorised transactions and the lack of segregation of duties through system access restriction provides opportunities for fraudulent activities. Now, that's a very serious matter, uh, Mr Chair, a very serious matter. And uh, for the Lord Mayor to brush over it and say, you know, this is, oh, this is all academic exercise, the only people that will be interested in it are, uh, uh, you know, council accounting staff and the audit office, no one else would care less. Well, I think differently, uh, Lord Mayor. I think that uh, with the uh, opportunity for fraudulent activities being affected, then it's a serious matter. It's particularly for this council, which is not too far in the future, had the invoice fraud where we got uh, done over for, uh, what was it, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, and uh, never, never saw the money again. And of course, we just had the, uh, uh, the ethical services report, the part of the uh, uh, the uh, annual report last week, which showed uh, a number of people that were referred to the Triple C, and we didn't get any details about what had been involved there, whether there was any uh, money went missing, or whether there was other other issues that were raised, and we never found out what 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 happened to those people, whether they were uh, their employment was terminated, whether the Triple C charged them, whether they went to court. We never we don't know. So these sort of things are really important things, and uh, it's it's not uh, right for the Lord Mayor to just brush over them. Uh, so that one on uh, IT con general controls, it's work in progress, due date November 2019. Hopefully it will be finished by then because it's, that sounds the uh, one where there's the biggest problem, uh, but they're all problems. The other one is unreconciled heritage and cultural assets, valuation data to the fixed asset register, rating deficiency, and untimely capitalisation of completed and ready for use assets and ageing of assets under construction. And that's a work in progress again and due date May 2020. A lot of these, uh, the amount of time that it's going to take to rectify the problem uh, by May 2020, I mean, we'll be back when, almost up to the next financial year before they finally get it. And there'll be another list of uh, problems to be, to be resolved. So uh, overall, this reflects an administration with uh, an attitude problem. And their responses, when you look through the, uh, the update from management, the council response to a lot of these things, it's, oh, you know, there's been a difference of opinion. We really haven't done anything wrong. And, you know, uh, you know, audit officers being unreasonable, reading between the lines. Well, that's just not good enough. Uh, the audit office are the uh, organisation set up to uh, audit uh, councils like the Brisbane City Council. They need to be treated seriously and uh, council needs to get its act together. Further speakers? Oh, thank Allen. you, Mr Chairman. I rise to... Uh speak on the item, the QAO final management letter. Um, it's kind of interesting that Councillor Cummings should jump up and say that he's never seen a, uh, you know, a more qualified report. In fact, the report isn't qualified at all, and a man who holds as many uh, public company shares as Councillor Cummings should know this. Um, if he uh, just flick through some of the annual reports that the companies that he has shareholdings in, um, and have a look at their auditor's report, he'll find plenty of uh, fodder. This is actually a 
a very, very good report. Any auditor worth their salt is always going to be able to recommend improvements, and that's what we're seeing here. So what I would remind uh, Councillor Cumming is that the report um, as issued was that the financial statements of Brid Brisbane City Council were fair and true. In the process of doing their audit, they pick up items that they think are worthy of further review and process improvement, which is exactly what they've done in this particular instance. I would point out that the audit committee reviews the progress against these suggestions on a regular basis and to suggest that there's some sort of um, significant issue at foot, afoot here is totally false because once again, if there was, the Auditor General would not have issued an unmodified audit opinion. So to suggest that, you know, the, that the report is anything other than a strong endorsement of the financial statements and the processes within Council is incorrect. But I would have to say you know, there are certainly a number of items there where we can um, obviously improve, and that's what you would expect from a collaborative, productive um, arrangement with an auditor. That's what we've done. We'll see, um, as you've seen in the, um, the letter there, our management has responded to the issues that they've raised. They've given a very good response to the uh, Auditor General. They've outlined what they're doing, what the key issues are. They've given a status on the response and also provided a del delivery date. And uh, I note that all of the uh, items are expected to be delivered on within this financial year. And given the complexity of council and some of these items, it will take a little while to, uh, to address them. But in the context of these being um, material or in some way uh, reflecting a, uh, a major issue, I don't, uh, I don't agree, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, just briefly on this item. Um, this is unusual. Now, whichever way the new finance chairman wants to um, try and split hairs here, um, I agree with Councillor Cummings. I haven't seen a report like this come forward to uh, council that I can recall. Um, normally, we used to get more detailed reports from the Queensland Audit Office. Now we just get the one-page letter. Um, but clearly, they are concerned enough to raise a number of administrative problems within council's financial accounting systems. Now, they're quite specific, I agree, um, but they indicate that there is a problem in the way in which that this council is um, financially managing its assets and its resources. Now, the Lord Mayor wants you to believe there's nothing to see here. The finance chairman um, says there's nothing to see here, um, but the Queensland Audit Office uh, has issued a report, not just sort of said quietly to council behind the scenes with some you know, uh, non-statutory advice. They've issued a report which has to be publicly tabled in council and disclosed, saying that there are serious problems with the way these aspects of council's financial business is being run. Now, that is a worry. Um, infrastructure charges, I can completely understand why they think there is a problem. Do you know what you have to do? And I, any other councillor who's done this, put your hand up because I doubt there's another one. If you want to know how much infrastructure charges are attached to a DA, you physically have to go up to uh, the council office in Brisbane Square. Um, get them to find the giant books that they have no idea about. So last time I did it a few years ago, or the first time I did it, they had no idea. Then they're not in date order. They're not in DA order. They're in order of approval, uh, I think. Is the, or no, they're in order of when the DA was lodged. So they're not in consecutive order. Um, you don't know which ones were approved and which ones weren't approved. That's council's record keeping system for one of the major sources of revenue um, for our city. Uh, and you basically got to go and look in a ring binder folder and before X year, they're just not available at all. They weren't kept, maybe, I don't know, but they're not available. So I, I certainly understand why the, audit, uh, uh, the Queensland Audit Office have raised concerns about the way in which uh, this, uh, these issues are being run. The other thing that strikes me with this um, is that obviously the Audit Committee of Council meets monthly-ish. Um, and we get month after month these reports that tell us nothing 
um, about what's actually happened. So presumably Council's known about this for some period of time because the Queensland Audit representatives uh, come to the Council Audit Committee reports. We're not invited as councillors. We don't know what goes on. We get a report each month which basically says a report was tabled by X. That's the outcome of what we get. So how long has this been a problem? How long has Council known about this? Um, I think if we're putting rectifying by 2020 on it, and it's nearly 2020 now, my best guess is Council's known about this for some period of time. Um, and uh, I would just say that far from what the Lord Mayor and Finance Chairman would have you believe today, um, this is an unusual uh, report to Council. Um, it's a special report. It's a statutory requirement that it's tabled. Um, and if this was minor and there was nothing to see here, then um, we would see the same usual process of uh, report come through with flying colours, uh, which has not happened this year. And that is a concern. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, we could have saved $500,000 going to the audit office and just gone to Councillor Johnston to audit our books because she knows everything about this sort of stuff. Um, so I, I apologise that we've done the wrong thing here and gone to the respected authority, and I apologise uh, that they've issued us with an unmodified uh, audit report this year, which, you know, in layman's term, means it's good, means it's, there's no major issues, means that the only issues raised are minor in nature. Um, so look, I'm sorry, next year we'll do better. I'll now, <coughs> excuse me, I'll now put the item. All those in favour of the report say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. <coughs> excuse me, a, uh, there is a division called by Councillor Cumming and Councillor Strunk. Eyes to my right and nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and 6 against. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. Councillors, the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee report, please. Deputy Mayor. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport and Economic and Tourism Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Davis, to the report of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, before I get to the substantive report today, I want to talk about something to do. Well, I want to raise again an issue which is similar to what we've been talking about earlier today, where apparently whenever there's an issue, it becomes council's responsibility to fix. I spoke last week about serious assaults that have been occurring against bus drivers, which are absolutely unacceptable. And we continue to see assaults from the local community on bus drivers, which are absolutely unacceptable. However, tomorrow I've got the union marching on my ward office when who they should be marching on is Minister Bailey's office. We have got 
six. We have got 6,000 bus stops, 3 million trips and 76 million passengers riding our network each year. What we have seen over the last three months is 153 verbal assaults. Verbal incidents that have been recorded, mind you. There's probably many, many more that weren't recorded. Unfortunately, there's also been 11 incidents where there has been physical harm. Some in the bus, some outside the bus, some at interchanges, some at bus stops. But regardless, all of this behaviour is absolutely unacceptable as our bus drivers go about their work diligently and make sure they are providing the highest level of customer services to our passengers. But it's clear some of the community have zero respect for them. There's no sense of patience or decency when engaging with council drivers. They spit at them, hurl abuse, hit them, threaten them with all sorts of objects. And our drivers need backup in their roles as public-facing transit officers. We need people who can be on site quickly and have the ability under the Transport Operations Act to protect our drivers. For more than two years, five letters and two years later, through two from Lord Mayor Quirk, two from Lord Mayor Schrinner, one from me, we have been asking the state government to step up and supply senior network officers to provide the safety and the support that our bus drivers need. Recently, I did get a letter in May, two months after the letter in March from Minister Bailey, sprouting that he's recruiting 16 new additional senior network officers. But what we have recently found out is that was not 16 new additional officers. Additional, not likely. Filling in the vacancies to finally get it back up to the 70 that are required across South East Queensland as a minimum is what those 16 were. That is absolutely outrageous. This state government has hired 26,000 people since 2015. 26,000 public servants since 2015, and not one of those employees have been related to security on Brisbane's bus network. Not one. But I did take the interjection from over there. Oh, I'll ask the state to do your job again. They're your bus drivers. We do supply security guards at our interchanges, but there is a very, very different, different level of Transport Operation Act legislation, which is why we need senior network officers. Only can be supplied and employed by the state government. They can issue fines. Security guards cannot. They can detain an offender. Security guards cannot. They can handcuff, they can search, they can take names and addresses. This is what our bus drivers need. This is what Minister Bailey and the state Labor government repeatedly ignore and fail to supply to make sure our bus drivers are safe in the workplace. And it is a disgrace. It should not be Brisbane City Council officers that the union are marching a rally on tomorrow. It should be Minister Bailey's office because they stand beside us and they agree that we need senior network officers. This is crime. This is community crime and it needs to be stamped out. And it's about time that the state government stood up and took some of the blame for this. It is not council's responsibility. We put the guards on, but they don't have the legislative ability to do anything but stand there and watch and then report it to a senior network officer who is not there. We also need tougher penalties, more presence and a rule of law that is enforced, which is why I have written again to the Attorney General today asking her to change legislation that will increase the prison time for those who assault a bus driver from seven to 14 years just like the state government did with paramedics. These are frontline officers that are out in various workplaces across the city. Again, the RTBU stand with this on our issue. 
So if the ALP councillors would like to do anything to support their bus drivers other than stand up and personally attack me week in and week out, get up there. Councillors, allow the deputy mayor to be heard in silence, please. Deputy Mayor. I ask them to speak to their Labor colleagues, to Attorney General Yvette Darth, to Minister Bailey, and say, get us the senior network officers our bus drivers need. Change the laws. So we've got a law that is serious enough that the next time somebody thinks about hurling abuse at a bus driver or throwing a bottle in their face, they'll think twice when it's a 14-year penalty. At the moment, the legislation does nothing to deter these crimes. And we're asking the state government to step up and do their duty when it comes to protecting bus drivers across the city. With the report last week, Mr Chair, we had the Northern Brisbane Bikeway. Again, a reason why we have gone up four fourth places in the most livable city. We are committed to that $100 million Better Bikeways for Brisbane program. Our next stage of this is the Northern Brisbane Bikeway Bridge Street to Kedron. Brook. This is about getting that travel option that gets you across from the Kedron Brook Bikeway on to the Northern Bikeway. It's a fantastic way to get people out and be active, and there's some great innovations in this project, which will be wonderful to introduce into Brisbane that we can trial across other parks in Brisbane as well. We know the Kedron Brook Bikeway has more than 1,000 cyclists a day, but it goes north-south, as does uh, the Northern Bikeway as well. This one will give us that east-west connection to two major bikeways. The details include a shared park on Chalk, path on Chalk Street from Bridge Street. There's a reconfiguration of a dedicated left lane on Chalk Street, longer green phases for cyclists. There will be bi-directional bikeway running alongside a separated footpath on Kedred Park Road, restricted access to Wellington Street for increased safety. Our very exciting new introduction of a green street, which is a low-speed shared environment and a concept that's been welcomed by the community. So we're looking forward to implementing that in this project as well. We've done the same at Little Dock Street recently, and it's been a very successful part of the Kangaroo Point bikeway as well. The idea is to make it as safe as possible to motivate people, whether they are leisure and recreational bike users on the weekend or commuters during the week as well, so we can get a smooth correct connection between these two important pieces of infrastructure. The allocated funding is $1.243 million this financial year, and it's all about getting residents home quicker and safer. There was also two petitions, but I'll leave that to the chambers. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. I just rise to speak on item C, the petition objecting to the relocation of bus stop 50 from 137 Nathan Street to 145 Nathan Street, um, Brighton. And this one was another example of um, the pitiful um, consultation that this administration uh, enters into with the community when it comes to uh, this, um, uh, this program of upgrading bus stops. We have seen the uh, numerous examples around the city uh, at how badly wrong um, this administration uh, is getting some of these bus stop moves, and that um, ultimately comes down to the lack of consultation with the local community uh, and explaining to the local community and going through uh, those issues with the local community uh, and working through those issues that are identified uh, in finding a suitable outcome. We saw it at Norman Park uh, a couple of months ago uh, in Councillor Cook's area, uh, the magically disappearing bus stop that had to uh, magically reappear quite quickly. Uh, and this bus stop uh, the relocation from 137 to 145, the, the, the grand total um, number of uh, constituents of mine that were consulted uh, with this uh, move were, was one. One person was consulted, and this is um, all the while um, uh, this stop relocation affecting uh, quite a number of people. It's right near a school, right near a very, very dangerous um, zebra pedestrian crossing, where we've seen just in the last year a number of uh, Nashville State School students um, uh, put in harm's way. Uh, this bus stop is being relocated much closer to that, uh, to uh, and right in between that zebra crossing and the new uh, proposed bus stop, uh, 145 Nathan Street. Uh, is uh, um, nose in parking at a local uh, set of shops there where we have vehicles coming in and out uh, quite regularly. 
Uh, so local residents, when they saw this move happening, uh, were rightly concerned about how all these things are interacting with each other. Uh, and to the project team's credit, they did attend an on-site meeting. It was on a Tuesday. I wasn't able to attend that, uh, given we were in council. Uh, but the feedback that the residents were given was that basically uh, the direction they received is that it, it is proceeding. So the residents started a petition, which is what we have before us, 121 signatures. I know it was a topic of hot discussion at Nashville State School PNC meetings as well, and uh, at the local shop, Pete's shop there, uh, and other businesses. I know uh, a lot of people uh, um, shared their concerns around the relocation of this bus stop. Uh, and the person that was consulted uh, um, subsequently sold their house and moved, and it was for sale at the time, which again just goes to how lacking uh, the consultation around this was. Throughout the process, once the petition was lodged then, um, people were still continuing to ask questions and asking for updates around this. The project team said they would no longer provide my office with any information around this. Uh, during the petition process, of which was later rectified, um, but that information, um, that information still wasn't very forthcoming. Now, um, Councillor Adams said last week in the committee meeting that, um, uh, as, as he set out in the response, the, the reasons that council has put forward for moving the stop from 137 uh, to 145, they're, they're the only two options that were on the table. Now, if they were, um, that's certainly not been explained to me or the community, uh, and what other options were assessed uh, in doing that. Um, there is a loss of parking for those local businesses as a result of this. Um, uh, it is being shifted further away, and I think anyone who talks to any local business owner, particularly a very small um, uh, retail operations like this, where they're very discretionary spending, if it's uh, difficult to find a park right outside there, those businesses uh, inevitably suffer from that. Um, so there are a whole heap of issues uh, with this relocation of this bus stop, and at no point um, uh, has the project team or Councillor um, Adams' office um, fully explained uh, what other options were looked at throughout this process. I accept that um, the stop at uh, 137 uh, was problematic, given it was on a bend in the road. Um, but I think, um, given the issues that the locals, local residents have raised, uh, moving it to outside 145 Nathan Street is also very problematic. Uh, and therefore, I will, be, um, I will be taking the side of my local residents. Uh, and uh, as I said to Councillor Adams in the committee uh, last week, I uh, forewarn uh, this administration that I don't believe those uh, residents who have these serious concerns uh, will take this decision lightly. Further speakers? Uh, just a point of order. Could I ask that um, that item be taken seriatim, please? Item C. For, vote. For voting? Yes. Further speakers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, that was exactly what you had represented in committee last week, um, that you weren't supporting it. I understand that, but I do need to put a little bit of the um, some of the falsehoods in your um, speech to um, just make it very clear. Um, this was a relocation bus based on DDA compliance. It was about making as many bus stops as possible of our 6,000 accessible easily for people in wheelchairs or walkers or strollers or anybody who has a special need to get onto the bus. Um, as mentioned, 137 Nathan Street is located on a bend, so it was unable for the bus to pull in parallel with the kerb, which is the biggest problem when you need to get the wheelchairs in and out with the ramps. It's also located directly opposite the T intersection of Nathan and Sunwell Street, where most of those cars from that local school come in and out. And there had been complaints in the past around buses pulling up opposite that T intersection and causing uh, difficulties, particularly during school hours, getting in and out when a bus is stopped there as well. So we had a look at where the most suitable place to move it to, and the most suitable place was to 145 Nathan Street, less than 50 metres away. So then Councillor Cassidy did say only one person was consulted. That was not the case. We followed the guidelines to speak to the people that were losing the bus stop and the people that were gaining the bus stop. In the case of the person that was gaining the bus stop, they had no issues with it whatsoever with the bus stop coming out the front. Um, we left the contact card and there's been no concerns about that. With the person that the bus stop was moving from, uh, moving, yeah, moving from. Yes, they changed owners. 
they changed owners. And so after the owners changed, we went and saw the new owner as well. So we're up to speaking to the old owner and the new owner at this house. And again, the new owner was happy with the information. Noted he'd bought the house two months ago, was unaware of any consultation, but had no issues with the proposed works. Hence, we moved forward. There was a change in the parking, I agree, and it is difficult around shops to get the balance to have buses that will drop patrons off for the shops as well. We need to remember that some people will catch the bus to the shops and it will be more attractive if they're 50 metres close to the stop. But we have replaced the two bus stops, again, less than 50 metres away where the bus stop used to be. And we've also installed bus zone signs. So this bus stop will not be a bus stop outside of 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if the shops are open in the evening, it's no longer a bus stop, it's back to parking. So they've actually, in the evenings, gained two car parks in this area as well. So we have tried to address all of the um, petitioners' concerns with this. I understand residents don't like change. I absolutely understand that. But we also need to say in this changing world, we need disability compliant bus stops. And that is the reality, hence why we move forward with this project. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, uh, councillors. On items A and B, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. And on item C, all those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. All Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Ayes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. away. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and 7 against. Councillors, the ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. <laughs> Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We had a presentation uh, last week at committee to update on some infrastructure trials that we have been undertaking. Uh, this particularly related to our anti-hooning trial, which started on the 1st of May this year, is going to be running for 12 months. Uh, it is certainly, of course, as this chamber would be well aware, a matter for the Queensland Police Service to enforce, but we do receive a number of complaints about hooning in local communities. Uh, in particular, we had some complaints about uh, hooning at Chua in the outer western suburbs. Uh, so uh, we understand that um, the community were experiencing great frustration by the time QPS were actually able to respond, the Hooners had gone. Uh, and we investigated a number of options to discourage them, uh, including traffic calming devices. Uh, we looked at raised 
reflective pavement markers, looked at cameras, as well as a seal treatment to the road. So following investigation, officers recommended the preferred treatment was the seal treatment, which was found to be a very effective and practical solution uh, where other options would not necessarily discourage this uh, hooning behaviour. So this involves having bitumen with a modified rubberized binding sprayed onto it, uh, and it has an angular shaped aggregate that is resistant to wear. It works by keeping the tyres gripped on the roads, and when a driver is hooning and loses traction, it shreds the vehicle's tyres. Uh, just to note, there was a few people who were concerned it might actually cause, imp cause um, people to slip or slide on the surface. In fact, there is no measurable impact to vehicles driving or cyclists riding over the surface in normal conditions, and officer officers advise it's in fact safer for drivers travelling normally as they are less likely to lose grip on the road. So at the moment we're trialling a site out at Alawa Road, Chua, uh, and we are undertaking, I note that the local council is very happy to see that, um, we'll be undertaking an evaluation of the, of the effectiveness of the trial. So there's six criteria. We'll be looking at physical evidence of hooning. We'll be looking at feedbacks from the residents in the community, residents from QPS, uh, feedback from industry, feedback from the local councillor, and then we'll be doing pavement investigation to see how the seal is holding up. So uh, initial investigations in the first week of the trial, we saw some tyre marks, which indicated some attempts to hoon. However, there have been no new marks since then until recently, uh, where we discovered a couple of new marks, but those we um, believe one of those is actually from a truck that is bra was breaking. We've had no complaints about any further hooning from members of the public to the ward office or SEQ Water since the installation. And we've had QPS, local QPS report that there have been no uh, reports of any hooning or any um, feedback about any hooning activities since installation. We've also undertaken a skid compliance test, uh, and that un was undertaken in July, which advised the seal has held up uh, uh, very well, and we've got regular um, we've got regular inspections that are undertaken. So we're also now investigating some other sites. We've got 12, sorry, 11 sites within Acacia Ridge, Willowong and Pilara that we are reviewing uh, and talking to local councillor, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, we will be, um, as we have with the site at Chua, we'll be undertaking site visits and tra traffic observations. And we've also met with local QPS uh, regarding these matters. So we're going to be um, rolling out that next trial potentially in October of this year. Uh, with confirmation, of course, from local councillor. And we also had an update at committee last week about the U-turn signage, which we are trialling at six locations uh, across the city. So at the moment, the current U-turn prohibited signs are yellow with black writing, uh, so quite a bit of writing on those and no images, which can be difficult to understand when driving through uh, traffic signals. The approved sign, that's the regulatory sign for non-signalised intersections, is a U-turn with a red line through it. And that, of course, is easy to understand, but it's not approved by DTMR at signalised intersections. So we had a presentation at committee on the 8th of August 2017, uh, and we talked about um, this particular issue and the challenges for drivers who's, um, who do not have English as their first language. And there was quite unanimous support from members of the committee to, um, to look at other options. Uh, so I wrote to the minister and requested consideration of more simple signage. Uh, we got updated in May of last year, uh, including the statistic that on average 3.8 casualty crashes occur each year at traffic signals in Brisbane involving vehicles uh, performing U-turns. So um, following the feedback from TTMR, DTMR that they have approved those trial locations, we've got the trial in place, which will be uh, going for 12 months. And we, of course, before um, commencing the trial, undertook pre-surveys, first round of surveys were completed our follow-up surveys were completed in June. Uh, we are going to be um, continuing to review the crash data, and we're meeting with the Queensland Police Service this month to gain their feedback about the trial. To date, we've received no complaints about the trial, and the initial results of the trial show the number of U-turns at all six sites has reduced by 25 to 40 per cent, which I think is a really excellent result. Excellent result. Council officers are now going to be undertaking um, collection of further da data to validate those results to see if instances such as seasonal variations may have an effect. 
So we've completed the surveys in August. We're currently analysing uh, the results from those and the next round of surveys will be completed in November. So I really want to thank the officers. I think this has been a, a tremendous uh, attempt to try and make some significant changes uh, to make it much more easy and simple for all those drivers and make sure that as we move around our roads, we move around safely uh, and we all return home to our families in one piece. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on item B, uh, the petition requesting council installs a zebra crossing uh, and build outs near the intersection of Appel Street and Venue Road East, Graceville, to provide a safe crossing point to Graceville Rail Station. Um, this is an issue about which I've been campaigning, I'd say, at least eight years, um, when Pat Chin uh, was the traffic and transport officer who looked after our area. Um, it's been something, uh, it's clearly needed in this location. Uh, it's a very wide part of the street. It's right outside Graceful Rail Station and it's an underpass uh, across under on Avenue to, uh, to get to the shops. So it's used not just by people using the rail station, but it's used because there aren't a lot of crossing points across the Ipswich rail line uh, for my community. Uh, we have two active school travel uh, schools uh, nearby, Christ the King and Graceful State School. So every morning, hundreds of children uh, cross at this location, as well as uh, all the commuters who use the train, all of the students going to high school, uh, and uh, everybody who uh, crosses to go to the shops or to just to move generally around our community. It is hugely busy. Uh, it was a uh, focus of MoveSafe. Um, it's been raised consistently with me for many years, and it was a big focus of the MoveSafe feedback that was put forward. I was promised, promised by Council's traffic officers that when the state government did the upgrade of the Graceful Rail Station, that Council would put the crossing in. Now, that's what the officers told me. It's been on my budget list for—I'd have to go back and have a look—but I'd say eight years. Uh, it goes in every year, um, and I waited until the station uh, was completed. Now, that's been done for over a year, and there's been absolutely no action from this council whatsoever. So we pushed in MoveSafe last year. No action from council whatsoever. So uh, together with the community I represent, we did a petition. Nearly 500 residents signed the petition. Um, it's clear that there is a need for this. It is clear that it fits with council's strategy. Uh, to ensure that we improve safe crossing points uh, for our community. Um, this is for both uh, functional travel and also rail travel. Uh, that would be a great benefit to the community I represent here at Graceville. And for example, I live at Sherwood, um, but if I'm heading down uh, to Graceville Memorial Oval, I'll often use this underpass and cross at Appel Street to go back up on Avenue to Sherwood because there are limited crossing points. Uh, the low rail bridge at uh, Long Street East, does, the footpath is about 80 centimetres wide. It's just not used by anybody. This is a hugely busy pedestrian crossing point. It clearly needs a zebra crossing. It's a simple fix. Um, it, it, and this has been like the mirage, what councillor are offering here. Oh, we'll do a plan for you, but we're not going to give you the zebra crossing. Um, I, I've heard this before, and, and you know, everybody here will go, oh, she's just having a whinge. In 2009-10, Council put money in the budget to light, uh, to do a plan to light uh, Vellelli and Lagonda Street parks. Now, the money was there, 10 grand was put aside, the plan was done. Did Council ever put the money back in the budget to actually undertake the lighting upgrade? No, they did not. So I funded it out of the trust funds when it became clear council would do nothing. I do not want to see this uh, end up in the same situation. Now, I'm not sure that build-outs will be needed. Um, I believe council are looking at putting it on the uh, northern side of Verney Road, um, which would not need build-outs. Um, so if that is the location that is preferred through this investigation process, then that's great. That'll make the project even less. Um, but uh, I'm not prepared to sit back and say uh, that simply doing a plan is good enough. Um, we must have safe crossing points at busy uh, uh, rail stations and busy underpasses that provide access for students uh, who are 
brilliant participants in our after school travel program, as well as local residents. Now, I raised my concerns about the recommendation, um, which if you read this report, you'd have no idea. It just says I supported the recommendation. I was very clear that I believe that it should be funded, not just planned. Um, so I do have an amendment that I'm moving today, uh, which is that at uh, paragraph 28 uh, in the recommendation on page 5, paragraph 3, delete the word subject to an assessment of priority relative to other competing citywide projects and insert provided this financial year. A second. Thank you. Could you please repeat that? I'm on uh, section. Are you, oh, excellent. Thank you. I have an amendment for paragraph 28 on page 5. Paragraph 3 that you replace uh, subject to an assessment yeah it's the um, it's in the second sentence of the third paragraph on page five following the investigation funding for construction will be subject <coughs> will be provided this financial year will be what replaces that sentence there councillor Johnston to your amendment please Yes, currently the recommendation reads um, that the investigation will determine the appropriate crossing point and identify any utilities that may be affected. Following that investigation, funding for construction will be subject to an assessment of its priority relative to other competing citywide projects. That's the boat that it's been in for the past decade. It's clearly that's going nowhere. That, that's putting it on the never never list where this administration just simply refused to fund things. Um, so, in my view, as I advised Council during the consultation period, we should not only be planning the zebra crossing, we should be funding it uh, so it is actually delivered uh, and we can ensure that residents and school students in Graceville and the surrounding suburbs can safely cross the road. So the amendment simply changes uh, the words relating to funding to say that the funding will be provided in this financial year. Now, today we've just heard the Lord Mayor announce possibly up to $2 million out of some secret slush fund uh, for sporting clubs, for water rebates or grants. I'm still not clear on what that's actually for. It's not budgeted in the budget. Um, there's some 400 clubs in Brisbane. I'm working on $5,000 a head. If there's $2 million that the Lord Mayor can stand up and announce will be provided to sporting clubs to provide water, then he can find $30,000 in a $3 billion budget this year to fund a zebra crossing to provide a safe crossing point to residents uh, in graceful and surrounding suburbs, and particularly students who are such good participants in our active school travel program. Uh, this Lord Mayor seems to find money for just about every other thing that he wants to do. Uh, he can find money for advertising. He can find money uh, to uh, buy huge amounts of money for new sporting fields at Nudgee. All we want here and all I've wanted for a long time, it's not like I'm asking today, is a zebra crossing, a bit of paint on the road that will cost this council, I'd say, twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That's it. It's a very small investment in making it safer for students from Christ the King and Graceville State School to cross the road to participate in a council-funded program and to provide safe um, access to public transport uh, for uh, people using the train in our area and for residents generally to move from one side of the rail line to the other. Um, it is critical that this project is funded. I don't believe leaving it on the Never Never list uh, is an appropriate course of action. This is $30,000 that should be well spent uh, actually delivering the process. So instead of just saying we'll plan for it, let's make sure that we not only do the investigation, draw up a plan, but we deliver it in this financial year. Clearly, clearly, Given a off-the-cuff $2 million budget announcement by the Lord Mayor today, there is money in this budget to deliver one-off projects like this, and uh, I believe that the money should be made available to fund this zebra crossing, and I ask all councillors to support it. Uh, further speakers? 
Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you. I note that the LNP have not risen to speak uh, about this. I hope that does not mean, as has been their standard practice since 2010, that they will just vote this motion down. Um, I thank the Labor Party for seconding it so that we could have the debate about it today. Um, and I'll just say, when it comes to putting your LNP candidate in the field, in Tennyson Ward, you will be walking into the most horrible environment because you have not supported the local community out there. You really will be letting people down when you say no to a simple project like a zebra crossing outside one of the busiest rail stations uh, in the network and to support the active school travel behaviour of two wonderful local schools who participate in Council's program. It is essential that all councillors support the zebra crossing so we can get on and deliver what is a simple but effective safety project uh, for pedestrians in Tennyson Ward. I'll now put the amendment. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Second. Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Strunk. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Councillors, can you please be silent for the reading of the result? Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 19 against. The noes have it, please return to your seats. Councillors, further, uh, further speakers to the substantive uh, papers. Councillor Griffiths. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, will speak quick, quickly to this um, to the infrastructure report. Um, there are two issues I'd like to speak on. Both relate to um, to the presentation we received last week. Um, the first one uh, is in relation to the outcome regarding the U-turn signage. I welcome that, that, uh, that um, we've made progress on that um, between the, um, the uh, state and Brisbane City Council. It's actually good to, um, to know that we've spent a bit of time in committee meeting. We've had a sensible discussion uh, with regards to the issue of the U-turn the or no U-turn sign and uh, that we've actually seen um, a positive approach to the state uh, which has resulted in this trial. Um, one of the things I think the public likes hearing is actually when we can actually achieve something, get something done. Um, and I think that's what we've done here. Obviously, everyone would like, I think, a simpler solution, which would be that um, at, at places where people don't do a, can't do a U-turn, we've just put up a no U-turn sign like they do in Sydney, uh, New South Wales and uh, Victoria. but. Our law in Queensland is, uh, is written a different way to the other states, so that needs to be dealt with at the state level by TMR. So this is, I think, a good compromise, makes sense, it's a good trial, and it's good to hear that there's, um, there's been change in behaviour for, um, for people using, uh, using these signs, so I welcome that and I look forward to the end result and hopefully the state picking it up. So that's the first thing. 
And the second thing, I actually another positive thing, uh, which is nice to do occasionally, is uh, welcome the um, the uh, the interest in the Hooning trial. Certainly, my ward has been very is is very impacted by Hooning. It's not because I have a whole lot of Hoons living there, but I have a lot of industrial area. Yeah. <laughs> Potentially, they come further, from further south, but they. Um, the, the ward has large tracts industrial area boarding, uh, bordering residential areas, so obviously there's targets for a lot of hooning. A number of those sites are passed on to our, our, um, to our transport area. They're familiar with it, so I welcome this, uh, this trial in the area and think that's got the opportunity of having some positive outcomes as well. So yeah, I think these two have been um, very positive outcomes for our committee over the last, um, last quarter that we've been going. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper. Um, uh, all right. Councillors, I will now put the report. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor of the City Planning Committee report. Councillor Burke. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, I move the report of the City Planning Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Seconded, Mr. Chairman. It's been moved by Councillor Burke, seconded by Councillor Toomey, that the report of the City Planning Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Burke. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, three items on the committee agenda for last week. Uh, we had a uh, great presentation on the Art Force program that is run uh, by Council. It is 20 years old uh, this year. Uh, I I remember uh, just a few years ago, Councillor Cooper talking in this place about the 15th birthday uh, of this particular uh, program, uh, and I'm also uh, here uh, long enough to um, uh, remember the 10th birthday of the Art Force Awards, uh, Mr Chairman, as well. Um, and it is uh, a program that has gone from strength to strength. It has received bipartisan support during that period of time, and I acknowledge the uh, former councillor of this place, David Hinchcliffe, uh, who was instrumental, I think, at the start uh, of this program and project, uh, Mr Chairman, and saw it through while he was uh, the chair of planning in the city as well. Um, it has gone... Um, it has gone, as I said, from strength to strength. There is literally uh, hundreds of these uh, traffic signal boxes and now Energex substations across the city that have been brought to life, uh, enlivened with uh, fantastic artworks done by local artists to capture local community sentiment, local community events, local community history and culture, or just beautiful pieces of art uh, that represent the city flora and fauna from our local area, and many, many more images, Mr Chairman. Uh, as I said, uh, it has been a, a fantastic project, a pro program that has been embraced by uh, residents and by the arts community in Brisbane, uh, and obviously uh, it continues to be well supported uh, by this administration. Uh, Councillor Toomey uh, had the pleasure the other night of attending the Art Force Awards, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, where we had 12 nominations in the under 12 category, 12 and under category. We had five nominations in the 18 and under category, 11 nominations for the best organisation category, uh, 10 nominations for the best Energex cabinet category, uh, 22 shortlisted artworks for the overall winner, um, and we had uh, 32 shortlisted artworks for the Lord Mayor's Award. Uh, and I look forward to coming back at a later date and being able to provide uh, Council with an update on who won those. I didn't, it wasn't part of this uh, presentation, uh, but I certainly look forward to um, informing the Chamber about the particular artworks uh, that won. There's two petitions also on the agenda, Mr Chairman, and I'm happy to leave those for debate in the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. I'd ask that uh, item B be dealt with seriatim for uh, voting purposes. B for, for B, seriatim for voting. Yes. In uh, relation to uh, item A, just briefly, it's, uh, it's a bit of a shock to hear one of the uh, administration councillors acknowledge that this was, was a program that was started under Labor. And uh, councillor, the Lord Mayor said earlier that uh, Labor did nothing uh, when they were in power. I can recall a few things, City Cats, Contact Centre, Toll Free ICB, water meters, etc. anyhow, and the Art Force Awards, just amongst a few. But plenty of things that Labor achieved when they were administration. Uh, the uh, in relation to item B, uh, this is a matter where uh, it was a petition of 15 residents which they prepared and gave to former Lord Mayor Quirk back in the days when Brisbane had a decent Lord Mayor. Uh, residents were in... in <laughs> 
sorry. Residents were upset that five people could start living in the one could be living in the one building on a small lot in low density residential areas without any public consultation and with only two car parks being provided on site. That's all that's required. I agree with their concerns and uh, these applications should require, I'd say, five on-site car parks and uh, be impact accessible. They, were, uh, they weren't publicised at all. This sort of development wasn't publicised at all during the 2014 city plan. Uh, they, it, if it had been publicised, there would have been a lot of opposition out there in the general community. Uh, and uh, in my area, I've had uh, a uh, succession of uh, um, uh, events that were in low density area where there's multiple dwellings, duplexes effectively have been built, uh, uh, places built with granny flats where, and then advertised for, for uh, people to purchase the site as dual income properties and they've moved on to that to becoming class 1B buildings all in low density residential and uh, in, on small lots. And the, this response makes no attempt to deal with the issues raised by residents and we'll be voting against it. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks. So I wasn't going to rise to speak the motion. I, I don't support the response either, but I just wanted to clarify that my reasons for not supporting the response are quite different to the Labor Party's. And I'm extremely concerned and dismayed to hear the suggestion that a, a five person share house needs five off street car parks. Um, I accept that there are concerns about inadequate um, parking in many parts of the city, but that suggestion is clearly ludicrous. So I just want to clarify, yep, I'm not, not supporting the response, but it's, it's definitely not because I agree with Councillor um, coming on that front. Further speakers? Councillor Burke? Um, thanks, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I thank Councillor Cumming for his, his contribution. Um, I think if Councillor Cumming goes back and reads Hansard at the time, I think Councillor Cooper probably acknowledged Councillor Hinchcliffe and his involvement in Art Force as well. I, I, I don't have the Hansard in front of me, but I think if I remember correctly, um, it's been a bipartisan um, uh, program uh, that has been funded and delivered and expanded, of course, under this administration. Because while the Labor Party likes to talk a big game on things that they uh, did when they were administration, uh, this administration has expanded and enhanced a range of things uh, to deliver more outcomes and more to see and do uh, for the residents of Brisbane, uh, like no administration uh, before, Mr. Chairman. So, um, you know, thanks, Councillor Cumming, for your, your your contribution on on the actual presentation that we had. Uh, it was negligible, um, but uh, if you want to rattle off uh, achievements of previous administrations, I'm more than happy to have that debate any day of the week with you. Um, rooming accommodation uh, is an interesting. Um, uh, series of uh, arguments that were put forward there by Councillor Cumming. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Burke, excuse me. Um, there's been probably the last 20 minutes a lot of private conversations going on in the room. Please, I have no objection with people discussing things outside, but please allow the Speaker the courtesy to be heard in silence. Councillor Burke. Um, there is a need as a city to have a holistic approach to making sure that we are providing accommodation and housing typologies that support as many and as varied a range of residents and their situ personal situations as possible uh, and not to do it uh, if not to do it in concentrated locations uh, but to allow that spread across the city to make sure that they can be accommodated in their local communities we do neighbourhood plans, uh, Mr Chairman, to look at providing a range of housing options and housing diverse, diversity across the city. We also have provisions that sit inside our neighbourhood plan in certain zones and, co and, and the codes that sit behind them to help make sure that we can provide a range of housing options and housing choices across the city. Councillor Cummings' argument just now is that we should ban rooming accommodation and that typology of housing across the city completely. And where you do have it, if you can have it, you should have five car parks for a five bedroom rooming accommodation uh, facility. Um, I, I, I shudder to think, Mr Chairman, if this is the Labor Party's approach to rooming accommodation, what their other planning approaches to different types of planning issues across this city will be. 
We know that they don't support aged care or retirement living uh, in the city. They're now attacking rooming accommodation, Mr Chairman. Uh, where they will be, they don't support density around transport nodes because they don't support it when we do it through neighbourhood plans. Where are we going to be left to accommodate the people that are coming to this city and, that are out, and our dwelling targets that are outlined in the regional plan by the state government, Mr Chairman? At some point, Councillor Cumming, as the leader of the opposition, I remember when we had a decent leader of the opposition, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, at some point, Councillor Cumming, as the leader of the opposition, will have to stand up and spell out how the Labor Party plans to manage the growth in this city. Because that is one of the challenges that this administration has done and, and continues to deliver on, building the infrastructure, planning the growth and making sure that we can protect the lifestyle that the residents of Brisbane love, that we all love as citizens of the city of Brisbane, Mr Chairman. And part of that is making sure that we provide a range of housing choices for someone who is moving out for the first time, the, fir the person who's looking to buy their first home, someone who's looking to downsize, a young family. You need to have a range of housing across the whole of the city. And one way of doing that is pro by providing rooming accommodation, Mr Chairman. And for the Labor Party's approach to be implemented, that would spell an end to rooming accommodation in the city, to have five car parks or even one car park for every bedroom. For four bedrooms, you need to have four car parks, which is what I think Councillor Cumming was alluding to. So at some point, Councillor Cumming is going to have to fess up and come clean with the residents of Brisbane on how they plan on managing growth in this city, because at the moment it is a haphazard approach that they have. There is no logic to it, Mr Chairman. We, on the other hand, on this side of the chamber, have gone out. We've engaged with the residents of Brisbane through Plan Your Brisbane. We've listened to their feedback and we're implementing their plan for the city through our blueprint for Brisbane. Mr Chairman, we continue to deliver that on today and we'll continue delivering for the residents of Brisbane well into the future. Further speakers? Oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, I'll now put item, items A and C. All those in favour of items A and C say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, and all those in favour of item B say aye. 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 The contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. D division. division. Councillor Cumming and Councillor Strunk. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Clerks, please ring the bell. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour, 6 against and 1 abstention. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. Councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee held on Tuesday, the 27th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Richards. The report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Hammond. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Oh, thank you. Um, with more than, uh, on their Facebook page, there was over 200,000 people engaged in the Facebook page. 3,000 free native plants were given away. And with the Green Heart Fair Facebook events, they received over 5,900 RSVPs. Um, what was really interesting um, and surprising and delighting, I will say, is 46% of the people who went to the Green Heart Fair um, at Carindale were first timers. So this just goes to show how important these Green Heart Fairs are. Um, I haven't caught up um, with Councillor Atwood or Councillor Murphy of who won the billy cart race. Um, so, oh, it was Councillor Murphy. Congratulations, Councillor Murphy. Um, in the committee last week, we had the pre um, presentation of the fabulous Victoria, Victoria Park vision. Um, we had one name, park naming, and four petitions. I'll leave the debate to the chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on item D. Undoubtedly, the cutest residents of Cooper Reward are the koalas. The administration wants to make Brisbane Australia's koala capital. These animals are a true icon of our city and need to be protected. As many of you know, koalas are already listed as vulnerable under national and state environmental laws. But sadly, koala numbers in Brisbane are threatened due to a number of factors, including dog attacks, vehicle strikes and disease. That's why Council is continuing to invest in programs aimed at supporting and protecting these very special animals. When I learned about this petition, I met with the Cooperoo Finger Gullies Bush Care Group to walk the gullies and to visit the area, which is a known home to koalas. On that particular day, unfortunately, we didn't spot any, but we did see plenty of evidence of koalas. And every time there's a koala in the area, I'm grateful for the bush care group who regularly send me photos to keep me updated of the latest local koala activity. Chair, this time of year, as you know, is breeding season for koalas. Many people know they are more active at this time of year as they search for mates and new habitat, and that means they cross roads. Boundary Road, which runs through Cooparoo and Camp Hill in my ward, dissects two areas of local koala habitat. Variable message signs that alert drivers to potential presence of koalas have already been installed on Boundary Road and are being rotated for, two, three, for three two-week intervals during the breeding season. Additionally, Council will be increasing koala warning signage on Boundary Road and care for our wildlife koala signage in key locations on local streets between Boundary Road and the Cooparoo Finger Gullies. Road markings will also be installed at the entrance points to the Whites Hill area on Boundary Road. Council will also create koala climbouts on the steep roadside batters to keep koalas that may become trapped on the carriageway. We will undertake additional street and park tree plantings in the area between Boundary Road and the Cooparoo Finger Gully Parks, which will focus on additional food and refuge opportunities for koalas and other wildlife as they move between habitat areas. We'll also be erecting signage at the entrances to the Cooparoo Finger Gully Parks, advising visitors there are koalas in the area and to keep dogs on leash at all times. I want to thank Councillor Hammond for her support in introducing these practical measures because these steps can be done relatively quickly and will help protect all local wildlife. It's also worth mentioning that Councillor Griffiths was supportive of this petition response in committee, so I want to thank him for that. In the longer term, it would be good to see other wildlife infrastructure introduced along Boundary Road. However, infrastructure like underpasses or overpasses and gantries would really only work in conjunction with wildlife fencing, which acts to funnel the animals through the safe passages. And as Boundary Road is a very long road, as many of you know, a wildlife fence in this location is a bigger project, one that I hope we can work towards. In effect, those who know Boundary Road will also know the tree canopies do reach across the top of the road, almost creating a natural overpass for some fauna. I note this additional infrastructure is being considered for future funding, and I welcome the response. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Oh, wow. Yes, that's not often I'm mentioned by the opposition. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. I, I rise to speak uh, on, on the particular petition that was just discussed. So I think it is item E. I hope I got the right number, but it's a petition relating to implementation of road safety measure, measures 
for the safe movement of koalas and other wildlife cross boundary yeah. road to D, D, D. Sorry, D. item D. Um, I just want to say yes, uh, that was accurate. I did vote for this last week. I voted for this last week on behalf of the Labor Party because we saw this as the minimum, the minimum, the absolute minimum this administration could do in responding to what, these 900, nine, I thought it was 1,000 signatures. It's the bare minimum. In fact, it's embarrassing how little you're doing. I'd love to be out there and hold a public meeting and let's see what residents have to say about the lack of what the LNP has done for the last 15 years in relation to this issue. Apart from buying, everything. <laughs> Apart from buying, buying blocks of land that they've allowed to be cleared yep. for well over the market value of the land. Let's not go there. But this, like yes, markings on road makes, uh, make a lot of sense. Yes, having ko koala climates, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but it sounds like you're doing something. And yes, having flashing signage there makes sense. I asked for the numbers of koala deaths along this stretch of road, and I believe the chairperson told me there have been nine koala deaths and 13 injuries. But I'm happy to be corrected on that. Um, oh, I'm misleading the chair. <laughs> So, Mr. Chairman, I, I thought there was a point of order there, but yeah, no, no, there wasn't. Okay. no, no please continue. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's interesting the number of koala deaths along that stretch of road. And after all this time with the LNP in administration, with the Lord Mayor and Deputy Mayor hugging every koala they can get their little hands on, um, we're not able to do much in reality to save these koalas. And what's even worse is we have a weak councillor over there who has no, no say in terms of obviously what ENC are doing and is not able to get the resources for her ward. So she's over there saying what a great job they're doing when in reality, in reality, I have no doubt that she knows what an appalling job they're doing. What I'd like to know is why is there no fencing along this stretch of road? After 15 years of LNP administration, why is there no wildlife fencing along this road? The state have come to the party. They've done it over at uh, Tui Forest at Tarragindi in terms of repairing fencing so that... Oh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Another interjection from Lord Mayor, but no, oh, actually Lord Mayor's in the room. But another interjection from the Lord Mayor, but no, pull up on that. Um, so in regards Griffiths, to hang on, hang on. Councillor Griffiths, you interject a great deal in all, all through the meeting. And I get pulled and, up on and it. And you get, get pulled I up, get pulled one up on maybe it. one in every 12 times you interject, all right? So I please get pulled up on don't, don't uh, I, I have a very light, um, a light touch in these matters, please. Um, <laughs> I, I, allow, I allow you to interject a great deal, uh, well, then and I, I, I allow Councillor Johnson to interject a great deal as well. Please continue. In any case, my points are clear. An, LM, uh, an LMP administration has done little or nothing here. Little or nothing. What we would do is fencing along that road. What we would do is culverts along that road so that the fencing would work so that the koalas or the wildlife had the opportunity to move under the road or um, in the case of uh, putting gantries across the road as well. So we would provide, we would just move on this and do this. And we'd have better signage and we'd do it in this budget. So this mayor and this administration are weak in terms of what they're doing. Good with the PR, but poor with delivery on the ground. What we've seen here is very little delivered, and a candidate out there, an LNP candidate out there now, wanting to sing the praises of the mayor, who's done very little for this, for this wildlife. We know the amount of wildlife that is killed along this stretch of road is appalling. This is one of the koala hotspots of Brisbane, and yet what this administration is doing is too little and too late. 
So yes, I'm going to support this petition, but wow, as a council, we should be doing so much more and so much better for our wildlife and for our koalas than just running a PR, PR campaign for the mayor and deputy mayor. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I asked to speak on this matter as well. Uh, this was, oh, sorry, uh, item. Yeah, yeah, that was the deputy mayor. Yeah, there she goes again. Uh, I rise to speak on item D. Um, this matter came to committee last week, and I was astonished at yes. the response from this uh, LNP uh, administration. One thousand residents uh, of Cooparoo and surrounding suburbs, mainly, have signed a petition calling on council to do the following: increase signage speed reductions, traffic calming, underpasses, rope bridges and overhead gantry so that wildlife, including koalas, can cross the road. Now, I actually feel sorry for Councillor Cunningham because she is very new and she does not know when she's getting done over. Um, she, she's got no idea that she's getting done over when it comes to a thousand people signing a petition. She's got a little bit of LNP-itis. Um, she likes to talk about things. Uh, she likes to look like she's doing something, um, but then you're not actually doing what the residents of Brisbane, in this case, a thousand petitioners, want you to do. So let's have a little talk about what they petition for. Um, increased signage, tick. That's all we're getting. We're going to get some mobile portable signs on the side of the road. I know koalas are beautiful animals. I'm not sure they're that smart. Let's hope that as the drivers whiz past at 60, they'll go, Shh, there's a koala sign. Oh, was that a koala sign? Was that a slowdown sign? Was, was that, that a roadwork sign? Was that a vote for me LMP sign? Could be any of the above. Here's what they're not doing. Here's what they're not doing. This is what petitioners asked for. Uh, they asked for speed reductions. Is the LMP doing that? No. Do do. Traffic calming. Is the LMP doing that? No. Do do. Are they doing underpasses? No, do do. Are they doing rope bridges to go over the top? A really effective solutions that this council has used in many other locations around Brisbane, including the outer southern suburbs, that have demonstrated value to help wildlife cross busy road corridors. Are they doing rope bridges? No, do do. Or an overhead gantry? Are they doing that? No, do do. However, Councillor Cunningham is out there. I saw a story in the local paper and I had to laugh my head off. She's out there with Councillor Adams, who I would not be going with her as a role model on how to manage local issues because Councillor Cunningham, you may have missed it, but she's not beloved by her community, would be my observation. My observation is that when a thousand people say to you, please help us do something, to address the issue of koala deaths and injury or other wildlife at this location, which clearly is a hot spot, we should do something. Yeah, yeah. We should do maybe some of the things Brother. that have been suggested. There are six different suggestions. The LNP is doing one of them, the cheapest, least effective one of them. Now, if a thousand people in Brisbane want this council to act, I say we should. Yeah, yeah. It is not good enough, in my view, that the LNP dress up a response that looks like they're doing something when they are not actually doing anything. And you will be found out. This is the biggest thing. I don't know why you keep thinking you're going to get away with this. You can't go out and tell residents you're doing something and pretend that you're fixing a problem and then not actually fix it. Residents aren't silly. They know what's going on. So as I said, I feel a little bit sorry. I, ha I feel a little bit sorry for Councillor Cunningham because she's new and she does not know that she's got done over. But to go out and sell such a terrible response to a serious issue, um, an important issue for the community as a win, when you're not actually delivering on the serious practical measures that can help native wildlife in our community, that's not a win. That is not a win under anybody's circumstances. As a member of the committee, I was appalled by the fact that we were ignoring what they were suggesting. I don't think this is good enough. I said it in committee last week and I'm saying it again. There are simple practical measures that we can take that will deliver a better outcome for the wildlife in this area and stop uh, possums, 
I don't know, koalas, whatever's going, birds, whatever's going across the road there, it can have a much better outcome if we do some more of these initiatives that the community are clearly asking for instead of, instead of over and over and over and over again, the residents of Brisbane in their thousands telling the LNP what they want and the LNP going, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, not going to do that. We're going to give you some variable message signs. I mean, even the fencing that they wanted, too hard to do, too, too hard to do. I mean, Councillor Cunningham, the Lord Mayor announced $2 million today out of the blue, boom, like that. He's got the money. He just doesn't want to do it. And I think that selling it as a win to the community um, is absolutely wrong. In this case, council should be doing more. I'd like to see them in my area. Yeah. Absolutely. If we had um, a bit of support to do them out in my area where we have a lot of wildlife crossing the roads. Yep. I mean, this council says no to me about getting the duck crossing signs. I had to fight to get them. They took them down in the Corso um, and we noticed they were gone and I asked them to be replaced and council said, no, you can't have your duck crossing signs back. I had to fight to get a duck Councilor point of Johnson. order. Okay, they, uh, look, you've been talking about duck crossing signs for almost no, a minute. No. Could, could you just, um, I, I appreciate you, you, you may know. wish to want to take the whole time, Why? but can you, just, can you just be relevant for the whole 10 minutes? I mean, the duck crossing, I I was it was a, a cute story, job. but um, can, can we wrap it up and get on with it, please? I thought I was doing pretty well, actually. I can see why you want to stop me. But anyway, I'm finished now. Um, we, should be, we should be doing more here, and I think ignoring a thousand residents is just not the way to go. Further speakers. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I, de I uh, stand to speak on item D and rebut the condescending bullying speeches that we've heard on Councillor Cunningham. From those opposite, absolutely bullying Councillor Griffiths. You are abusive and vicious to Point many of women order. on the side. Point of order, I, Councillor Griffiths. I find that objectionable, yeah, especially look. from hang on, hang on, hang on. especially hang on, hang on. Every, everybody. Everybody, sit down. The biggest bully. Everybody, hey, everybody, stops talking. Everyone, cool down. You too, Peter. Councillor Cumming. All right. This is a place where we're going to, we are going to engage in courteous and respectful debate about the substance of matters in front of us. Deputy Mayor. Thank Point you, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Um, accusing uh, Councillor Griffith of being vicious and abusive is a breach of the meeting's local law, and those comments should be withdrawn. They are offensive. They are an adverse no, thank you. reflection No, thank you, him. Councillor Johnson. You've made your point. There's no need to debate in the point of order. Deputy Mayor, will you withdraw those comments? Look, I am sorry to say Councillor Griffiths was abusive and vicious. His speech was abusive and, grif and vicious. Councillor Cunningham has gone out Point and of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. We all heard Councillor Griffith in this place. He was none of those things. What oh, Councillor no, Adams no, is no, saying no, no, no. is a do breach not use, of the meeting's local Do not use point of orders to debate and me. It should be Deputy Mayor. Mr Speaker, point of order. Again, I'm not a speaker, As, I'm a uh, chairman. Mr Chairman, sorry. Uh, I mean, his... No, please, no, no, no. please do not use points of order to debate. Well, I'm just going to dissent. So if you can just let me carry right. out my, you know, okay. right. I dissent I have, I have in a, your failure have, to uphold the rules of procedure. No, that's not how it works. Seconded. All right. You have, I have a dissent in my decision. Moved, moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. All those in favour, all those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson, Councillor Griffiths. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr. Chair, the noes have it, the voting being five in favour, 19 against, and one abstention. The noes have it. Please return to your seats. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did withdraw, but I'll move on with item D. What we see here is a response to petition that has been considered, again, by our specialists within council and their consultation with environmental scientists across Brisbane, in particular with professors from Griffith University and University of Queensland that are specialists in the wildlife corridors and koalas in Brisbane. As the Lord Mayor said earlier today, if we just saved the money and asked Councillor Johnson, then we would have all had a, a quicker time about it, because apparently she is the know-it-all of every aspect. Just do it. Just do it. Koalas too. Koalas too now. Yeah. Councillors, please, allow the speaker to be heard in silence. It is very clear that there were several things on this list, and guess what? Sometimes you can't do some of these things, physically cannot do them. Can I say the number one issue here is that we don't want koalas crossing this road. There is nowhere for them to go. The studies show that koalas, when they're looking for their new territory, sort out the next highest tree and just want to get to it. There are some trees on the other side of the road, but then there is residential areas. We don't want them to go to that side. The professors have made it very clear from Griffith University that the culverts in this street are absolutely not suitable, large enough, wide enough, or go under the road deep enough to cater for any wildlife, let alone large koalas. Not an option. Gantry swing ropes only encouraging them to get across. Not an option. I am sure we could get signatures of way more than a thousand of people that want everything done possible to save our koalas, and that is what you see in this petition response. Councillor Cunningham made it very, very clear that we are investigating whether we can set some of the, uh, the fencing along this road. It's a kilometre plus road. But this road is also in, right beside Tui Forest. We are investigating the reduction of the speed kilometres. Tick. It's 70 at the moment. If people stayed in their own patch, they'd be right. If they don't know what's going on in their local areas, in our local areas, it's 70 at the moment. We're reviewing whether it goes down to 60. Tick. Wildlife signage. Tick. Electronic signage. Tick. Two and a half million dollars on an intersection upgrade that is slowing the traffic in that area because cars need to stop now when before they used to be able to fly through. Tick. We are doing exactly what we need to do in this area and will continue to investigate what else we can do as well. Councillor Cunningham, has taught Cunningham, as she said, has spoken to the Cooparoo Finger Gullies groups. We have spoken to the environmental groups. We have spoken to the environmental specialists, Councillor Griffiths and Councillor Johnson, and that is not you two in any stretch of the imagination. If they were concerned more about their own areas, like in Nathan, where the state government, I can tell you what you don't do to save koalas, and that is sell off bushland. Sell off bushland. Councillor Griffiths should be down there having a public meeting every Sunday morning, calling on Minister Dick to save that bushland. Too busy helping Matt and Carly trying to run the campaigns by getting busy in everybody else's space. Good luck with them now. Good luck with them. An appalling attitude we saw here this evening, Councillor Cunningham and Councillor Hammond. Thank you for the work you're doing here. There is more to be done, and we will be doing it. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on items um, B and E, but I'd also like to request that items B and D be taken seriatim individually for voting purposes. 
So, Councillor, you're B asking and for D. items B and D seriatim and it, separately. Yep, thanks. For voting. Um, yep. And I'll also flag that I'll be moving that item B lie on the table for further consultation. I'll get to that in a moment. Right. Just briefly on um, the petition for um, I item E regarding dog off leash areas in, kangaroo, in Captain Burke Park, Kangaroo Point. Um, I decided to support the petition response, but I, I wanted to ob observe that this raises a broader issue within Kangaroo Point where the population has increased dramatically, but um, council hasn't provided enough public green space to cater for that growing population. We now have hundreds and hundreds of residents who live in apartments and own pets. Um, I don't necessarily agree that it's good practice to be buying um, at, or owning animals when you live in a small apartment, but that's the reality of the situation. Um, and these people want dog off leash areas and there's simply not enough room within existing public parks to deliver them. I think the officers are probably right to suggest that um, Captain Burke Park being a major destination park that hosts a lot of big events isn't the best place for a dog off leash area, but we do need a dog off leash area somewhere in that northern part of Kangaroo Point. And there's existing parks are quite constrained and have other, other limitations on them in terms of space and land use. So I'm saying through you, Mr. Chair, to the Mayor, to the Deputy Mayor, and to um, Councillor Hammond, we really need new parkland in Kangaroo Point, particularly at the northern end. It's not enough just to keep cramming more facilities into existing public parks. Those green spaces are already getting very heavily used, so we need new public parks in order to cater for the, for the needs of the local community. I don't think residents are going to be satisfied at all with this petition response. Um, I think when, when the response to a request for a dog off leash area is to say, oh, don't worry, there's another one at the southern end of Kangaroo Point, 1.7 kilometres away on the other side of several very busy roads, I think residents are going to be pretty unhappy with that. So, um, it, yeah, it would, it would have been nice to see this administration engage more deeply with the broader concerns about insufficient public green space in the inner city, and I'm sure this issue will continue to pop up in the future. Um, just turning to item B, the petition regarding the, the naming of a park in um, East Brisbane. I, um, I think what's happened here is that there's been some miscommunication among council officers. I'm not asserting that there's any malice, but someone somewhere along the line has made a mistake. Um, a while back, I provided my feedback as to on, on the draft petition response. Um, so the petition's calling for the uh, a very small park to be named Watts Park. This is a small local park on the border of Woolloongabba and East Brisbane. Um, I'll read a little bit from the written response I provided to the officers. I said, the petition seems to have a little over 100 signatures. Out of the petitioners, it looks like only one petitioner lives in Woolloongabba, and that's the head petitioner who's seeking to name the park after himself. So the head petitioner lives next to the park, or his business is adjacent to the park. Um, He's seeking to have the park named after his family name. Um, he's, he's a nice enough guy. Um, I, I don't know him too well, but locals speak well of him. But I think there's a clear process problem here where any business owner can get 100 of their mates to sign a petition saying, please name the park after me. And then without further detailed consultation, that becomes the park name. So we've been in the process of consulting with local Aboriginal elders to see what name they would like to have for the park. And I think what would be a lot better is if the council were to run and promote a community vote where residents are invited to suggest different names and vote for or against different suggestions, rather than simply taking the first name suggestion that someone comes forward with a petition. So I'd um, flag that I'd like a seconder for this, but I'd, I'd like to move that item B, the petition response for the park naming be uh, lie on the table um, for further consultation. Maybe I don't need a seconder, but. Seconded. Thanks. Uh, so it's okay. I have a so it's a procedural motion. Sure. Okay. Moved by Councillor Shree, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All those in favour say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thanks to the Chamber for that. I'll leave and my comments there. Now, Councillor Shree, there'll be no more discussion. It's on the table. Cool. All right. On that matter. All right. Further speakers. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I'm happy. Um, to say and to support that motion, Councillor Shree, that you put up, and we'll hold that over for you. Um, it saddens me in this place, um, Mr Chair, when attacks or well, some things happen in, in committee reports when the councillor is happy to support 
the petition result, I'm talking about item D and Councillor Griffiths, he was very happy and supportive of the petition um, response in, in um, committee and then comes in here and just puts politics before koalas. That's all it is. It's putting a stunt out here that we are doing everything practical, Mr Chair, everything practical to help um, our koalas. And in the petition, it said we will investigate further measures. I don't, I, I'm, I'm saddened to think that the vicious attack that was laid upon our councillor, a female councillor by a male councillor, Councillor Cunningham, is deeply disturbing. Bullying is something that is rife in our schools. It's Point of order. That we should be. Point of order to you, Councillor, uh, Councillor Cumming. Uh, Councillor uh, uh, Hammond is crossing the line here. She could easily be sued for this. There was nothing in the speech that was bullying. Thank you, Councillor uh, and Cumming. Just, I understand she, the point you're making. You, well, you Councillor should, Hammond, please, tell keep, it. please keep your comments relevant and on topic. Um, and um, and and uh, I'll again, the bullying acknowledge... statement. But I will say that bullying is rife in some of our schools, and we should be showing an example which is what I was saying. I wasn't pointing a finger. Maybe Councillor Cumming um, has a guilty conscience. Um, but I was saying that we should be, as elected members, showing an example out there in, in um, our community. It's also disappointing that I actually went up and gave Councillor Griffiths the stats on koala death. He misled the chamber tonight, um, which is very disappointing. In the last seven years, Mr Chair, unfortunately, there has been seven koala deaths. Seven koala deaths too many. There has been 13, which I told him, hospitalisations of our koalas. Mr Chair, dog attacks is responsible, which I told him, majority of these hospitalisations. That's why I clearly said in the question I thankfully got asked this, um, earlier on today, please be mindful of koalas. Keep your dogs on lead, on, um, except in dog off leash areas, of course. Make your homes koala friendly and help us fight the cause. Mr Chair, I've had enough. I'm going to put on the table the truth about what actually happened and the backflips and everything else, the dishonest nature of those opposite. <coughs> Mr. Mr Chair, Carrara Street. When that was going on, the current Labor Lord Merrill candidate and the Lord, the, um, sorry, the councillor candidate for ALP was out there Buy Carrara Street now! Save Carrara Street! But what do we hear, Mr Chair, in this place? We hear now the complete opposite. This side of the chamber is about purchasing hectares and hectares, over 700 hectares of bushland preservation to help save our koalas. We are planting fodder for our koalas for the rescue. But consequently, over there, I've now backflipped. They're supporting the state Labor government in selling off state bushland. State bushland. The koalas are living. If they were serious about this, they would be telling their state colleagues, we can protect, state government can protect this land simply by not doing a cash grab on our koalas. This is absolutely disgraceful, and I've had enough of their misleading the community of Brisbane. Let me just make this clear. Over that side of the chamber, the current Labor Lord Mayoral candidate was out there saying, buy Kawara Street, buy it now. We did, we did. And now they're saying we shouldn't have purchased it. Again, this side of the chamber is putting koalas before politics and we will continue to do so.
by investing like never before into our koalas, buying bushland that no other level of council administration has ever done before. So stop your attacks on female councillors on this side and stand where, put your money where your mouth is and go up to your Labor mate just down the road in George Street and say no cash grab for the Labor government because we know they're in trouble. You can save this land. You don't have to sell it off because this side of the chamber is investing on private bushland so we can preserve. Why should the ratepayers of Brisbane have to fork out millions of dollars so the state government to bail them out of trouble when the people of Brisbane already own this land? Mr Chair, I am absolutely gutted by the political games that is happening over there. I am absolutely gutted that politics becomes before anything when it comes to the Australian Labor Party. I am happy to say with the leadership of Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner, we will put koalas before politics. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillors, I will now put items A, C, E and F. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, item D. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Okay, I will now proceed to the Field Services Report. Councillor Howard, Field Services Committee, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Field Services Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Marks. The report of the Field Services Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Just before moving to my report, I'd like to update the Chamber on um, the issue of glyphosate. Now, I've heard from residents who have concerns about glyphosate following media reports, leaving them worried about the safety of their families. And whilst we've been assured that our current program is safe, it is our responsibility to ensure that there is no stone left unturned when it comes to ensuring the safety of our officers and the communities they serve. As the saying goes, you can never be too sure, and every resident deserves to feel safe. And that is why Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner reported to this chamber a month ago that we have taken action to go a step further to ensure that there is absolutely no doubt in the safety of Council's weed management program and the use of glyphosate. We asked officers to write a report outlining absolutely every detail about how, what, where, when and why we use glyphosate products. And I say again, politicians don't make decisions on which chemicals are safe or how they should be used. The scientists do, as they should. And that is why we sent that report to the APVMA as Australia's peak authority to review. We ask them, as the nation's best scientists and experts, to be absolutely scrupulous in their scrutiny of the report and not hold back on their feedback. The APVMA is considered one of the world's most rigorous safeguards for the control of agricultural chemicals such as herbicides. And I'm pleased to report that Council received a letter of response from the CEO of the APVMA last week where he said, it's pleasing to me to see such a responsible approach from Brisbane City Council to ensuring that glyphosate products are used safely and in accordance with label instructions. So, Mr Chair, just for the, the, um, the benefit of the Chamber, you can find a full report, copy of that report, as well as a copy of the response from the CEO of the APVMA on Council's website by searching weed management. Um, so I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, moving to the committee report, last week we had an informative presentation from the manager of Green Space Asset Services um, on Council's leading mosquito management program. Council's mozzie control activities are scientifically managed, targeting specific areas where and when breeding is known to occur. As this chamber is aware, Brisbane leads the nation in mosquito, ma mosquito management. We remain the only council in Australia to employ two expert medical entomologists 
who collaborate with leading researchers to ensure we are using the best information and technology available. So together with ground treatments, Council delivers these, these uh, treatments via aerial sprays, which typically treat 1,500 to 2,000 hectares, with Council undertaking 10 to 15 treatments in an average season, which can cover up to 30,000 hectares in a season. Council also carries out more than 110,000 ground-based visits every year to treat mosquito breeding sites. And of course, our entomologists work closely with Queensland Health to ensure early virus detection. Currently, Council manages more than 2,500 known freshwater mosquito breeding sites across the city. In a typical season, our mosquito control unit will treat around 20,000 hectares of coastal salt marsh by helicopter with ground support by quad bike teams, utility and teams on foot. Our mosquito and pest management officers take great pride in their work, and I would like to thank and commend them on their outstanding dedication and pride in their work to keep residents safe and protect our Brisbane lifestyle. Last week in committee, Councillor Strunk asked the question about climate change. Uh, this administration has always acknowledged climate change, and we do not deny that climate change, um, what we do do, though, is to take it very seriously. And the only difference on this side is that we do not engage in alarmist scaremongering. While Labor is focused on making noise, we are focused on delivering for the residents of Brisbane. So, um, Mr Chair, I just would like to say that uh, there's an article in the Courier Mail asking us to double the mosquito budget. Um, and again, I don't know how many times we have to say this and to put it on the record. It is the long-held position of this administration that the budget is unlimited when it comes to managing mosquitoes in the city. Unfortunately, it seems that Labor have not listened when we have said time and time again that whilst over $5 million is allocated for mosquito and pest management in this year's budget, this figure is simply an estimate and a placemarker for bookkeeping purposes. We will always allocate whatever resources and budget necessary to our mosquito program. Council is always able to respond immediately to any and all works identified by our two expert entomologists. Every and any request from these uh, entomologists has been immediately responded to and completely fulfilled. And this has always been and always will be the case. Council has the capacity and is ready to respond to any changes that could occur due to climate change. We have to remember that weather does change, and some years the mosquito season starts earlier than others. Dr Hugo from the QIMR Berghofer Medical Research Institute Senior Research Officer is quoted himself in today's paper saying, it's one year. I think we need to watch for emerging trends in climate changes to be sure that we are saying it is associated with climate change. Dr Hugo said himself, that it is a complex situation. So last year, the mosquito season started later with our first spray in November, and this year, the season started earlier with our first spray on the 8th of August. In 2016-17, our first spray was on the 5th of August, and 10 years ago, in 2009-10, we had our first spray in August as well. So, Mr Chair, safety is our utmost priority. It's clear that Council continues to deliver Australia's leading mosquito program without compromise and continues to deliver the best possible standard of service to the ratepayers of Brisbane, and I commend the report to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, the information presentation session on mosquito management was interesting but somewhat uh, revealing. We heard about what Council is doing to respond to the mosquito, um, the mosquito in relation to the uh, seasonal treatment and the occasional um, uh, breakout that happens from time to time. Now, as probably one of the councils that have a large still body of water, uh, probably one of the largest in Brisbane, um, my community, of course, is very concerned when it comes to mosquitoes and the infestation that can happen with the still body of water. I posed a question, as the, uh, as the chair said, I posed a question to council officers in view that climate change is real and that global warming is taking place. What are we doing to increase the seasonal treatment to address climate change? The response I got from uh, council, um, council's presenter, right, uh, and uh, some other council officers are there as well, 
uh, was that they, uh, they did recognize that, of course, there is an increase in global warming, uh, but there isn't a specific plan to increase the treatment, um, the treatment at this stage, but they, of course, are factoring that in long term. Mr. Chair, I thought that, um, I thought that the response from council officers as, uh, as, and, 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 any, and any response was a particular good response um, for what they, from the limited uh, way they could actually, I suppose, respond to my question, uh, because there would probably need to be a policy change for them to uh, elaborate on what they probably were feeling at the time that I asked the question. So, Mr. Chair, on reflection, I think the investment of $5 million, and we've heard uh, from the Chair that that is unlimited, but I think what you put in a budget, the amount of money you put in a budget, or the amount of money you um, publicly announce that you are probably going to expend in any particular financial year is, is probably what you will. Um, and so I thought that uh, to, to double that would, uh, would not be out of, uh, would not be out of, uh, out of reason, right? Um, there was the article in the Courier Mail, uh, and we saw the response from the LNP administration, and I quote, Brisbane City Council's uh, mosquito management program uh, has the resources and flexibility to respond to change. Mr. Chair, we can't afford to wait. We need to get in front of the issue. It is not, simp not simply respond after, the, after it happens. The, the Brisbane City Council response is not really good enough. We know that dengue fever, Ross, fe Ross River fever, and Zika virus um, thrive in tropical and subtropical climates. And Mr. Chair, I've had a few friends over the years that contracted Ross River fever and I've, and I've seen the long-term debilitating effects of this disease on them. Mr. Chair, the health of the residents of the city should be paramount concern to any administration. The more we can do to reduce the mosquito infestation now and into the future, the more that we can reduce the impact of climate change in this particular area. Mr. Chair, we probably only have a few years to get ahead of the issue and I call upon Councillor Howard to advocate for more funding to better respond to what we know is a very concerning growing ecological problem that will impact many of our fellow residents into the future. I don't think what I said uh, in, in, in what, how I quoted, how I was quoted in the paper was anywhere near a, uh, a level of an alarmist. I think I'm a realist and know that you really need to invest in the future. And if we know something is about to happen or about to take place in the next uh, coming years, isn't it, we, we owe it to the residents of Brisbane to invest, to try to get ahead of the problem that we know is going to happen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further debate, Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Acting Chair. Uh, I rise to speak on item A. Uh, an old favourite of mine, uh, mosquito management, mos mosquito control, uh, as the former chair of field services uh, had uh, responsibility of this for a number of years. Uh, this is, of course, budgeted through Program 6, Community Health, but uh, so that's where the budget sits, but for delivery in field services. And as Councillor Howard has quite rightly pointed out, which has been pointed out on numerous occasions in the past, the budget for mosquito control is as much as is required as directed by the scientists. Um, we, we've just heard Councillor Strunk, um, perhaps more gently than some of his predecessors in this place, undertake a scaremongering campaign about the impact of mosquitoes in this place. And I'll come to Councillor Flesser, the unlamented former councillor for Northgate Ward, in a moment. But um, the, the reality is that uh, this is a program that is at the direction of entomologists who are the best in their field. Uh, Brisbane City Council is the only council in Australia that employs entomologists to undertake that task. Uh, mosquito management is an issue all up and down the eastern coast of Australia, has been all year. Uh, in Sydney, I can tell you, they don't have any capacity to do anything down there because of the this disparate number of small councils. They don't have any capacity to undertake any mosquito control, and the state government down there doesn't do anything either. So, Brisbane Council is at the forefront of mosquito control on the east coast of Australia. 
uh, the, the other councils turn to Brisbane City Council to find out what they can do to assist, and, uh, and they take the advice of the council's entomologists in this regard. Uh, I, um, I, I noted Councillor Strunk's suggestion that the budget should be doubled. Uh, from five, the current budget allocation of $5 million to $10 million. Look, the last time I looked at it, uh, throwing dollars at mosquitoes won't kill them. Uh, so, so, and, and he, but he, he talked about the need for policy change, but didn't say what that policy change should be or could be. Um, so what do, we, what do we expect from the ALP? In the past, uh, I mentioned the former councillor for Northgate Ward, Councillor Flesser previously, he had some wonderful ideas for the expenditure of the council budget on mosquito control. He, he wanted to release uh, a, a noxious fish called the, the gambusia into the waterways, a noxious fish that has been described quite rightly as the cane toads of the waterways. Uh, that was his suggestion, that was his solution. Uh, his other suggestion, uh, which has never been renounced by the ALP as a policy direction, was to crisscross the wetlands with, with runnels, with, with channels, to drain the wetlands dry. So a, a kill the village to save the village response to, to dealing with Point mosquito control. That's been the ALP policy in the past. Is that what Councillor Strunk is now suggesting with his suggestion of raising the budget from $5 million to $10 million? Uh, is, is, that what, is that what he's really advocating here? He didn't say anything. He just said, oh, there should be more money spent on it, but didn't actually advocate for anything in particular. And I'd be interested to see if they are indeed advocating the discredited, not supported by expert policies that the former councillor for Northgate Ward once advocated in this place. Um, Councillor Howard quite rightly said uh, in response to the, uh, the it, well in her earlier debate that uh, this is an unlimited budget. The budget is what uh, it should be or needs to be, depending on what the experts say. Uh, we should follow the experts' advice. This is a program that should and is quite rightly undertaken at the direction of scientists. Let's listen to the scientists and undertake the approach that they advocate, and we con will continue to do that in this place. A policy uh, direction based on science, not on uh, a, a thought bubble about doubling a budget without any idea about what it should be spent on. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on the uh, committee presentation, mosquito management. And I think um, poor old Councillor McLaughlin has finally lost it, Mr. Chair, uh, because that is the same speech that he gets up and gives in this place year after year after long year after year after year, uh, and that is based in no fact whatsoever. Uh, but I will talk about facts uh, when it comes to the mosquito management program uh, and the disaster uh, that my community faced last year uh, when this administration uh, and this uh, area headed by Councillor Howard sacked 12 permanent ground crew. Now, we're not talking about the medical entomologists. We're not talking about uh, the aerial spraying program, which is the only two things that uh, the administration will talk about. Uh, we're talking about those ground spraying crews uh, that were dismissed in the lead up to uh, last, uh, last mosquito season uh, and not replaced. And when we started raising those questions last year, Chair, uh, all of the LNP politicians got up and said, no, no, don't, don't know what you're talking about. Uh, we know nothing about these 12 staff being sacked, uh, nothing to see here, from the mayor down to Councillor Howard. Uh, but after weeks uh, of commu intense community pressure, they were finally forced into admitting that they had removed 12 permanent positions uh, from that area and miraculously will put some contractors on, they said, uh, and that will do. Well, that didn't do because what we saw were mosquito numbers in plague proportions, the worst mosquito season in living history. And I will not accept the excuses from the LNP that there was no correlation between sacking 12 people from that mosquito uh, spraying area uh, that had uh, intense. Point of order, Mr. Chair. To you, You've Mayor. been quite rattled, but there's no correlation to the committee report here either. Talking about mosquito management in Brisbane. Sorry, hang on. No, hang no, on. No, 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 I'll, no, I'll no, you, I'll no. You, I'll let you. Yep. I appreciate what you're saying, Deputy Mayor. However, I read uh, item six. The ground program treats 24,000 known, mainly freshwater breeding sites, and by implication, there must be somebody who does that. So I'll allow discussion around, around oh, that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So, so the contractors that were brought in uh, had no experience in these areas. Now, I'm not saying no experience in this area, but no experience uh, in the particular areas, the salt marsh areas, 
uh, that, um, uh, that mosquito breeding sites in my community. Uh, so what we saw, what we saw was an explosion uh, in the mosquito, uh, the mosquito population, and people that have been living in that community, my community, uh, for decades and decades and decades, and many, many of them, hundreds of people came forward and said this was the single worst season. So what we saw was a decision uh, taken by this administration. Uh, and they thought they could get away with it, Mr Chair. They thought they could get away with removing 12 permanent full-time positions and replacing them with a bit of overtime uh, and a few contractors. Uh, and it was, as I said, after intense community pressure uh, that we actually saw this administration uh, backflip um, spectacularly. Uh, so, and, and, and following on from them saying uh, that there is nothing to see here. We don't need to replace these staff. We have enough contractors, enough overtime, people doing overtime. After that intense community pressure, we finally saw them back down and a recruitment process actually start to replace those staff. So I want to thank and congratulate my community over the last year for standing up and making their voices heard on this very important issue. I know we'll have Councillor McLaughlin running around talking about something that was said, I don't know, eight years ago or something like that. Uh, but what is actually important and what is actually happening in people's backyards out there in uh, Brighton and Sandgate and Shorncliffe and Boondal and Zilmere and Tagum uh, and suburbs all across the north side uh, is they don't want to see uh, the plague proportions of mosquitoes uh, coming back this season uh, as a direct result of decisions that, decisions that this administration make. Uh, so I want to give that commitment to my community that I will certainly be uh, keeping on top of this issue uh, and requesting the regular briefings that uh, I have now been offered uh, from, uh, uh, from the divisional manager in this area to make sure that uh, my community is protected from uh, this administration's bad decisions. Further speakers? Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chair. Well, Chair, it is absolutely disgraceful and, quite frankly, extremely disappointing that Councillor Cassidy is again deliberately raising community fears and using something as important as public safety to play politics. It's unbelievable the lengths that Labor will go for their political games. Public safety is Council's utmost priority, and, I, and again I assure the residents of Brisbane that there has been absolutely no impact on our mosquito management program. Council, Council prides itself on its high level of service to residents, and in June last year there were a number of employees in Council's pest control team that were found not to meet these high expectations. I can advise that all staff dismissed during the disciplinary process have been replaced with permanent staff. Nothing to do with Councillor Cassidy. Public safety is our utmost priority. And I provide assurance to all residents of Brisbane that Council has all staffing and resources on hand at all times to undertake any works necessary. I'm also very disappointed to hear that Councillor Strunk doubts the advice of our expert entomologists. How appalling to hear someone that I quite respect on my committee stand up here in this chamber and argue about the advice that was given by our professionals. So, Mr Chair, again, a stunning display of political grandstanding from those opposite in this chamber. But today, Labor have stooped to a very new low. Chair, I just want once again to put on the record that we at all times make sure that this program is fully funded, that we at all times allocate whatever resources and budget necessary to our mosquito program. And, and uh, through you, Mr Chair, I recommend this to the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Howard. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee, please. Councillor Maddock. Uh, Mr Chair, I move the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 3rd of September 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Maddock, seconded by Councillor Cunningham. The report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Anyone at all? I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Finance and Administration Committee, please. 
Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of September 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Excellent. I'll now, is there anyone at all? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, consideration of notified motions, please. Councillors, I draw to your attention the notice of motion at item six on the agenda. Councillor Johnston, would you please move the motion? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr Chairman, I move that this council purchases the bushland at 67 Chapman Place, Oxley, to protect it from development. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Nicole Johnston and seconded by Councillor Steve Griffiths that this council purchase the bushland at 67 Chapman Place, Oxley, to protect it from development. Is there any debate? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, I rise tonight to speak on behalf of residents of Oxley, who I've met over recent weeks. Uh, they're on the other side of the road to my ward boundary with Councillor Griffith in Maruka. And uh, based on the determination by the Queensland Electoral Commission, uh, at the next election, they're likely to become Tennyson Ward residents. Um, residents contacted me to advise me that a DA had been lodged on 67 Chapman Place, Oxley. Councillor Griffith uh, organised a public meeting and I think about 30 residents turned up from the surrounding uh, streets and they're extremely concerned about the future of this bushland. Uh, I know Councillor Griffith has moved two urgency motions to try and protect this land, the first of which earlier this year I seconded and one only a couple of weeks ago, both of which the LNP uh, majority council have voted against. Today I'm moving this motion because this is a valuable piece of bushland uh, that should be protected. Um, it is linked to the Oxley Secondary College across the street, which is linked to the Fort Road Bushland Reserve, the Canossa Bushland Reserve, which is linked to the Brisbane River and Rocks Riverside Park. The addition of 67 Chapman Place Oxley to our Council's Bushland Reserve would be an important step forward in protecting habitat for native wildlife. Um, this site, as I understand it, has a really difficult history. There's been five different DAs, uh, and uh, this council has uh, indicated it would buy it, but has just never acted. And I think Councillor Griffith might say a little bit more about this. Having only come to the issue this year, um, it strikes me that it is absolutely essential uh, that this land is bought back. Now, I wrote to the Lord Mayor about this a few weeks ago, and I got a one-line response from him uh, today. Um, basically, he said to me uh, that—actually, I might read it out because—I'll read out what I wrote to him. Dear Adrian, it's come to my attention by the community today, and this is the 27th of August, that a new DA has been lodged at 67 Chapman Place, Oxley, and this significant bushland site is under threat. Councillor Griffith wrote to you about this matter two years ago, and I understand that you had indicated, or uh, the Lord Mayor at the time did, that the land should be protected. Two years on, nothing has happened. I've repeatedly lobbied you and the former Lord Mayor and the Parks Chairs, McLaughlin and Hammond, over several years about the need to protect and buy back land closely adjoining this site at Canossa and the Oxley Secondary College in my ward. The land at Chapman Place would provide a further link in the area to the existing Fort Road Bushland Reserve in the Brisbane River. It is a highly valuable ecological, ecological corridor teeming with native flora and fauna. This land should be bought back urgently. Um, I wrote this on the day they voted down the urgency motion. I go on. I'm shocked this afternoon the LNP have voted down another urgency motion to protect this land. Council recently spent $6.2 million buying back three residential blocks in Mount Gravatt with nothing but a few palms on them. This land is native bushland and I urge you to act to immediately protect it. Um, this was the Lord Mayor's response that I got about an hour ago, and I'll read it out. I refer to your email in relation to 67 Chapman Place, Oxley, located in Maruka Ward. As you're aware, this matter is on the council agenda for discussion today, and I would not want to preempt the outcome. Now, that's what he says to me. However, he's been writing to the residents today, and he's telling them something different. 
So I don't know why, honestly, I don't know why you keep doing this, um, because it just, these people talk to us. I don't know what you think we're doing out there, but we genuinely engage with residents and they talk to us. So a resident sent me a reply she received from the Lord Mayor uh, this afternoon, and I have to say it's, number one, different to mine. He did not tell her, well, there's a motion coming to council and I'll update you about the discussion uh, afterwards. He didn't say that to her. He told her that council wanted free bushland. That's yes. what he told her. Yes. Council wants free bushland. They don't want to pay for bushland. Now, let me be clear. Um, that is contrary to council policy. Council can resume bushland for uh, compulsory resumptions. Uh, it can resume it out of the existing bushland buyback fund, or it can now reduce it. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, purchase it out of the new green slush fund the Lord Mayor has set up. But no, this Lord Mayor wrote to a resident this afternoon, and he said this to her. Well, first he told her it was weeds on this land and he didn't consider it to be ecologically important. Now, this is despite the fact that it is mapped under the Brisbane biodiversity yes. overlay with a high ecological significance. Yes. A small, tiny part of it is zoned for residential, um, but the rest of the site is zoned as high ecological significance. Now, the Lord Mayor thinks he knows better. It's just weeds out there. That's not actually what the report has said uh, for the DA and the reports for the previous DAs. But let me come back to that. What I want to say to you is this is what the Lord Mayor wrote to the residents of Oxley today. Council's practice is to secure bushland at no cost to ratepayers where possible. Now, I'm sure they went up to the residence, uh, the owner of the land at uh, Mount Gravatt East and said, mate, give me your free land, please. I'm sure that's his first approach when it came to three uh, residential blocks not mapped in the ecological corridor, not containing any bushland. I'm sure he went up to the owner of that land in a marginal MP ward and said, give me your land for free. That's what uh, he thinks should happen here in Oxley that uh, residents should hand over the land for free. But in marginal LNP wards, this council will fork out $6.2 million. He then goes on to say that council will consider, consider the request after the, information, the conclusion of the public notification period. That's in two days. That's not good enough. That's kind of the response last time where the LNP did nothing. They said because it was in appeal, we couldn't do anything. The appeal stopped. Two years later, we're back, same boat, Council's done nothing. The Lord Mayor's letter goes on. Council is not ruling out the purchase of the land should the majority of it not be able to be secured for preservation at no cost to the ratepayers. Talk about mealy mouth up and down and around. So he is saying he will consider buying it. I can tell you um, that simply saying to residents that you want to acquire land for free is not what you have done in other parts of the city. The residents of Oxley deserve their ratepayer-funded bushland buyback levy being allocated into purchasing land that is uh, mapped in Council's biodiversity overlay in an area of high ecological importance. Now, um, the blocks that you spent $6.2 million on at Mount Gravatt did not fall into that category. Um, the land at 67 Chapman Place does. And I want to just give you a few comments from residents who have been writing to you in their droves um, and tell you what they want um, from you, Lord Mayor. Uh, he, here's one. I'm writing to you to urgently buy back 67 uh, Chapman Place, Oxley, a wonderful piece of bushland that is home to many wonderful native birds, mammals, frogs and reptiles. I'm a local resident, local business owner and a wildlife veterinarian that sees and appreciates the ecosystem as a whole and the role this piece of land plays. Our bushland levy should be spent on pieces of land just like this. Um, and they go on. And I thank every single one of these residents. It's been a joy to work with them. Um, and uh, they are informed, they are knowledgeable, and they are absolutely wanting to see the DA stopped and this land purchased. Um, and I will go on and give you an idea of how important this land is. 
Um, this land is not suitable for development because there are 112 identified flora species and six fauna species, including hollow bearing habitat trees. Now that's actually out of the DA's um, own uh, ecological report that's currently before council. Um, and this person goes on, and it would disrupt an identified waterway corridor and we would see trees lost. Over the years, we've personally witnessed a number of wildlife species. This year, we've encountered a family of possums, numerous scrub turkeys, a 10-foot carpet python, um, and we've seen nests and feeding places uh, where people make their homes in the bush. Um, so these residents who live adjacent to this site obviously can see the importance of it for local wildlife. Um, there are many letters uh, exactly like this, and it is absolutely critical that uh, residents listen to Brisbane, uh, Brisbane residents. Here's another one. Um, this resident identifies to the Lord Mayor all the wildlife they've seen. Green tree frogs and striped Councilor marsh Johnston. frogs, tawny mouth frog mouth. your time has expired. Uh, Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that this motion lie on the table. Seconded. I have a motion in front of me for the, from Councillor Richards, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that this resolution uh, lie on the table. It's a procedural matter. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. We need a division. Called by Councillor Johnston. And no one else? All right. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any petitions? No. Councillor Marks. Um, thank you, Chair. I have a petition for residents wanting security camera and a dollar. Councillor McLaughlin. That's all right. Councillor Strunk. Yes, Mr Chair. I'm uh, presenting a petition for the Councillor of Morningside. Um, 14,000... 14,000, um, I'm just trying to focus, 829 people um, that uh, want to save a German shepherd by the name of Katie from destruction. Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, so I just have a uh, petition in relation to address noise pollution and safety concerns in Annie Street, Rockley. Any other petitions? May I please have a resolution? Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. May I please have a seconder? Seconded. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Cummings, that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, general business. Councillors, yes, own... there is hang... general business, Mr Chairman. Yeah, no, thank I you. No, hang business. on. No, no, don't do that. Please, please, please. Take your seat. Oh. Councillors, are there any statements required as a result of a councillor conduct review panel order? Councillors, are there any matters of general business? Yes. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I stand briefly just to uh, tell the Chamber about and get very excited to support my local councillors in our community planning day that will be happening on the 28th of September. Um, we have a very excited and uh, supportive Malkavat East Townhouse Development Action Group that are looking forward to planting over 2,000 trees on a recently purchased site in Malkavat East. Um, they are also very keen to name this site Carter's Rest after the koala that unfortunately um, died at the hands of some domestic pets in this local area because it didn't have any trees um, to climb up. And I have started a petition on my Facebook so that we can present that to Council. Hammond in the next session to get that moving as well. It is a small size reserve, so it does mean that we need special effort, and the residents absolutely understand this as well. We need to secure it and make sure that we get the plants planted so that we can nurture and make this a sustainable site for wildlife from the outset and long into the future. It's a very important part of the corridor, again, something that the residents are very, very conscious of. 
It is a respite. For, it will be a respite for the koalas. And even though it only it had some palm trees on it, the photos you can clearly see that are in the Courier Mail and the local paper had koalas. Even though they were climbing palm trees, it was a corridor that they used to move through this very important part. It is a very important link between two larger habitats, between Whites Hill and Tui Forest. And that is why, as we heard in the petition today, and as we are doing across Brisbane, wildlife signages on all the major roads, flashing wildlife signs at these sensitive road crossings at Cavendish Road, Pine Mountain Road and Boundary Road in this area as well. I am more than happy to support my local residents to call it Carter's Rest. And I am I apologise to them on behalf of the chamber. As they said, they are very upset given the ill-informed and politically motivated criticism of councillors' purchase of this site, particularly when we know when there was an actual on-site meeting, or not on-site, a local meeting on 2nd of December last year, every colour of the spectrum, greens, red and blue, were their hands jumping up and down saying, yay, we are purchasing the site. Corinne McMillan was there, Rod Harding was there, my opposition was there, Joe Brisky was there, Ross Baster was there. Joe Brisky's t-shirts have clearly got their hands up, as my opposition has to, cheering that we were buying the site. The hypocrisy is astounding. But we know this is about Councillor Griffiths protecting himself on the Nathan site as well. There will be VPOs on this site because it's council land, so it instantly becomes protected, but it's more important so because in the future it will be food trees for koalas and other wildlife as well. I'm looking forward to the community planning day on the 28th of the 9th, and I hope all the residents will be coming as well. And considering it is after seven o'clock, Mr Chair, I move general that the meeting business. now conclude. We've got more general business. Oh, That's Second outrageous. Point of order. I've got general business. Point of order. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. There are still items of general business that councillors have in this chamber. Myself and other councillors here. This should, meeting shouldn't be shut down. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. I have to inspect the rules. What rules? Krista Adams just stood up and spent Councilor the last Johnston, 10 minutes do not talking talk about to me like how that, her bushlands protected against allowing even a debate about the land at Oxley. So she stood up here for 10 minutes, 10 minutes and justified... Councillor Johnston, why are you still speaking? Okay. The meeting because, shouldn't because be shut down, Mr. Behaviour, Chair. The meeting should not be the shut down. All those in favour This meeting say, oh, should not be shut down. <laughs> this meeting no. should not be shut down. The meeting has concluded. The meeting should continue. This is LMP rotting. LMP rotting. LMP rotting. This is not a fair this process. This yeah. is not a fair process. This is LMP rorting. They, they are rorting the system. Themselves. You are rorting the system. You are rorting the system. This is outrageous. This is wrong.